abroad. Please join us in a salute to the flag. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, liberty and justice for all. And would you remain standing? A moment of silence for Celia Krenko, um, South Orange resident who was very active in local government there, an activist for LGBTQ rights, um, actually was here in this room many times and on our front steps at different rallies, uh, died tragically in a fire. Thank you. Pursuant to Section 5, Chapter 231, Public Laws 1975, this is to state for the record that adequate notice of this meeting has been provided to the public by posting and maintaining the annual notice of regular meetings on the bulletin board of the municipal building, by mailing the annual notice of regular meetings for 2019 to the news record and Star Ledger in December 2018, and by filing said notice in the office of the township clerk. Mr. Adams? Here. Mr. Daffis? Here. Mr. Lembrick? Here. Mr. McGee? Here. Mayor DeLuca? Here. Whereas Chapter 231, Public Laws 1975, commonly known as the Open Public Meetings Act, requires that all meetings of public bodies be open to the public. And whereas Section 7A provides that the governing body has the discretion to permit, prohibit, or regulate the active participation of the public at any meeting, and whereas our governing body to comply with the provisions of SAC and time to conduct its business in an orderly and expeditious okay. manner. Now, therefore, be resolved by the Township Committee, Township Maplewood, that is hereby prohibit except to set forth in a formal agenda, active participation in deliberations of the governing body by the public, and except as otherwise described by law, does limit the public to the observation of the actions and discussions of the governing body at all of its regular and special meetings. So moved. Second. Ms. Adams? Yes. Mr. Daffis? Yes. Mr. Lembrick? Yes. Mr. McGeehee? Yes. Mayor DeLuca? Yes, thank you. Uh, welcome to the July 16th meeting of the Maplewood Township Committee. I'm going to run through the agenda. We will start with a public comment. If anyone would like to address the Township Committee, we ask you to come up to the mic, give us your name and your address, and share your thoughts with us. We then have uh, three ordinances on final passage. One is uh, dealing with uh, cold weather enclosures in the business district and power washing sidewalks. Two is um, uh, changing some of the outdoor cafe uh, requirements uh, for uh, commercial buildings. And uh, three is um, changing the organiz table of organization with the police department. Now, each of those are on final, so if you'd like to speak on any of those items, we'll have a public hearing at, each of the, at the time of each of those uh, ordinances, so you would come up at that time. Then we have an ordinance on uh, to introduce, and that um, is a two-hour parking ordinance uh, for Gerard Place. We have here a grievance hearing. Um, the grievances have been withdrawn, so and we've worked the, it out. So that's not going to happen this evening. We have uh, discussion items. We'll be talking about the library bond funding. Uh, the shared fire department with South Orange and the joint meeting proposal is one item. It's it's the shared uh, fire department. We'll be talking about the 2020 census, uh, opposition to more development South Mountain Reservation, tracking code enforcement actions and projects, alcohol consumption in public parks uh, as associated with event application, MAPSO Safe Rides update, and Ani Maplewood. Uh, we have our consent agenda, which has nine items on it. Um, Resolution about a sale of notes, uh, canceling grant funds, um, appropriating uh, money for the woodland renovation, uh, appointing uh, a graduate intern, uh, let's see, professional services for the swimming pool design for the pool filter, uh, awarding contracts for improvements at the woodland for Disability Act requirements, We'll be approving bills and claims, and then approving the open and closed session minutes of July 2nd. We'll have our second public comment, 
We have reports from departments, administrative reports, reports from elected officials, and then we will adjourn. Um, so we will begin with uh, public comment. If there's anyone who would like to address the Township Committee, again, please come up and uh, share your thoughts with us. Uh, good evening, David Humor, 26 Nelson Place, and um, I'm here to speak about the library bond discussion item. And in full disclosure, I am a member of the library board, but uh, the only thing I'm going to do in that capacity is to let you know that tomorrow night we're going to be discussing the same report, and um, I want to start first by acknowledging the unparalleled advocacy our mayor has for the library and that I know is shared by you in private conversations and through your actions over the years. And it is a terrific continuum and it's a great place to be because we need your help to get the allocation that we need for this project. The bond issue is only for $125 million. If we write the application the way our experts have told us and what the community has told us for what we need, we're gonna be asking for eight to 12, 10% of that money. That is a huge chunk of money. We need your help to have this happen. So I hope you have a, a fruitful conversation and I hope it leads to comments. The mayor's report in the library building committee report talks about square foot construction. I think that's definitely something that you should tell the state people about. Um, and since that's a knowable fact, that may be something that you can have commonality with other towns about. If you can identify other towns that are going to submit to the project. I will say from my experience, not out of any d definitive knowledge now, that there's often a north-south split, and you may want to ask for that as opposed to an adjustment to the number. It costs more to do this here, to build the same building here, than it does in South Jersey, and it may be a case that they're pulling numbers that aren't applicable. So that's a knowable fact, and you can get that. Um, and then the other thing is that, um, and, and the, that the, the report has correctly identified, that's a huge issue, how much they're going to give us per square foot and how they're going to classify what we do, whether they do new construction. And so I think any, any advocacy you can have on the efficacy of reconstruction within a space, not having land acquisition costs, not adding to blacktop, that kind of thing, you're in a position, I think, relatively few municipalities are going to respond to this. They're asking for a 50% match. You have huge skin in the game. You know, you're making an enormous commitment and investment in the community. So you should have some influence over how these policies get drafted. And I can't think there are going to be more than five or ten towns that are going to apply. So your discussion tonight can make a huge difference here. Because And I think the other thing you should tell them is that they should give money to towns like Maplewood, where the governing body is clearly committed to the library, way above and beyond the minimum. Because the building you build here is going to get used. And it's going to fulfill the, the, all the intangibles that they say they want out of this project. And they should not, you know, and, and this, I, 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 I will be interested in your language on this subject because there are equity issues involved. But you should be very proud of your record in funding the library on a day-to-day -day basis. It does enormous good in the community. And so I want to thank you for that and hope you have a fruitful discussion tonight and looking forward to your effective advocacy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else want to address the Township Committee? Good evening. Um, uh, my name is Virginia Lamb Falconer. I live at Three Winthrop Place. Um, I know you mentioned, Vic, the, um, the resolution for the Turtleback Zoo expansion. Yes. And was that, was that, I'm not sure where that stands you right now. You can speak now. about it now. Okay. All right. I didn't know if it was the right time. So I want to speak in opposition to the expansion. I'm, I was at the freeholder meeting last week. Uh, and I'm very concerned about the trends towards overdevelopment at in the South Mountain Reservation, you know, via the zoo expansion for many reasons. I mean, the most notable of which is that once this natural area is developed, it can never be undeveloped. And um, the, the zoo, you know, there's, there were a lot of interesting points brought up by a lot of well-informed people at this meeting last week. I think you were there, right? Um, including that the zoo, with its current 900,000 visitors annually, isn't making a profit. Um, and that, um, 
is there really additional this is an inside classroom space that they're proposing and it would it was they approved six hundred thousand dollars for planning and architecture um, and it would eventually be an eight million dollar expenditure for <coughs> classroom space um, so is it really necessary? I don't know. They have a lot of spaces there for formal type of education. In addition, they're talking about a grizzly bear exhibit, which would be $16 million. This is all apparently part of their master plan, but people have tried to find the master plan and they can't really find it. Um, so this all, uh, despite the trends, global trends are really away from large animal captivity enclosure because it's not healthy, it's not humane, it's not profitable. Um, recently, one of the giraffes out there died, I don't know. And, and the bears that are currently out there are not, uh, they're not, they're not allowed to hibernate because they don't want people to have to face an empty exhibit. So the two bears that have been there for how many years, they haven't really grown much because they don't hibernate. So it's really like a cruel and inhumane way to like educate the public. Um, so as I said, I think it, you know, its value as a natural space is really underappreciated and the woods are in terrible condition because they're not really managed as an urban forest. And if they were really actively and properly managed, they serve a great uh, role for water filtration, groundwater recharge, carbon storage, which is essential. Um, so in my opinion, uh, that the focus should instead be on managing the current forest to optimize its potential for environmental benefit as well as educational benefit. And um, there could be a fraction of the money invested and there could be m much greater environmental uh, benefit gained. You know, rather than showing people animals that are cruelly you know, um, in captivity as a way of educating them about the environment, show them our natural environment, show them why it's essential to protect. So um, I think that's it for me. So the resolution uh, is in process. Yeah, we'll be discussing it during the discussion okay. items, okay. and then if, okay. if there's a majority, then we'll pass it tonight. Draft it. Yeah, um, a version of what uh, the green team chair, mm -hmm. Tracy. Had. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Because I know West Orange is doing great stuff. Milburn Environmental Commission. There was somebody there from the former EPA administrator. There's a lot of knowledgeable people like involved in this issue. So I think it would be great to craft a really tight um, or uh, resolution because I think what's going to happen, what I understand, is that they're going to sort of trot out all the people who support the zoo. And I don't not support the zoo. I just think enough is enough with the zoo. So that's my concern. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else want to address the Township Committee? Hi, I'm Dennis Percher. I live at One Uber Place. I'm also head of the South Mountain Conservancy. Um, my concern is, is not as a purist. I mean, we maintain the trails in South Mountain. We hopefully go with the, uh, the county to, to do various activities within it. But the lack of transparency in terms of long-term planning of the zoo is my concern. Um, I like the zoo. I don't, you know, its footprint is relatively small. It could grow, but we always find out things after the fact, um, whether it be the $16 million ex uh, bear exhibit, the 500 car uh, parking garage that's, that was about 13, 14, actually $17 million of sand celery stuff. My concern is the lack, <clears throat> the lack of transparency, the lack of having a, a master plan, the lack of a real understanding of how it impacts the West Orange traffic. I went to the West Orange Open Space Committee um, several months ago, and they literally had a very high power lawyer who could, when we got up and asked questions, I said, well, what would the impact be on the worst days? So that's out of, out of order. You can't ask those questions. They're supposed to have done a traffic study. So a long-term plan um, is number one. Number two is, I like to see how the open space trust fund money is used relative to the various parks. There's a, I don't know how it can be used for operational purposes, but I know that in fact the staffing is for maintenance is diminished all the time. And we're always, you know, having to make requests again and again to get even minimal things. They put on a great events, but in terms of maintenance of the parks, the everything from the, um, uh, the, the broken water fountains in Summit Field and so forth. Um, you know, there are things and amenities that could be made. And I'd like to understand why so much goes to the zoo. It is a pet project of, of Joe D. That's all well and good, but the, the balance, I think, is off. 
So until we have a master plan and understand the balance in terms of investment, um, I think that the type of a, a declaration or that you're trying, if you're putting together, is worth showing that there's a concern that it's an out of um, out of control and not responsive to people's needs. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Anyone else want to address the township committee? I like that there's flags here. Huh. <laughs> uh, my name is Tracy Woods. I am at 253 Burnett Avenue here in Maplewood, and I'm coming forward today. Um, I'm also the chair of the green team, but today I'm just speaking for myself. And I have been a member of the South Mountain uh, Conservancy for nine years now, Dennis. And, Move that microphone. Oh, sure. There you go. Uh, and uh, so I've, you know, watched as, you know, year after year, bit by bit, little pieces were nibbled off and it always just felt like, oh, well, it's not that much. Okay, it's a little more, it's a little more, and it's got to stop. I mean, there has to be a part where we just say that the reservation, I mean, this is the same thing I said when I spoke before the freeholders, the reservation is the jewel of Essex County, not the Turtleback Zoo complex. You know, it's, it's a small zoo, it's a day trip. I took my kids there, but it's never gonna be the Bronx Zoo and it's never gonna be um, a world-class zoo center and it shouldn't be. It doesn't meet the needs of our community. And um, the expense that's been put into it isn't, you know, doesn't weigh in with what the community wants. And the stakeholder process has been so um, unfair and challenged that until they find a way to have more equitable um, discussions about this publicly, we, I, I would encourage the township committee to call on them to stop the expansions into the reservation. And that's in addition to all the environmental impact. You know, every um, quarter acre or acre or even more that they pave over with impervious surface adds to the stormwater runoff, which is always a, already a huge problem. You know, and we have worked so hard uh, here in Maplewood and uh, to protect uh, stormwater infrastructure that we um, have a history of wanting that to be uh, well pr preserved in the reservation. And then also, you know, the trees are carbon sink. And as our climate change future is coming upon us, you know, the idea of cutting down more and more of the forest to put up, you know, amusement park type I items just feels like a really a wrong, um, a wrong priority, especially when most of Essex County's residents agree that the amusement that we want is the forest. That's what we prefer, given a choice. And, um, and then in addition to that, uh, just the process for the whole thing where um, no stakeholder engagement has been, you know, it's been heard, I guess, we're allowed to say it, but you know, you have 200 people in a room screaming no, and then they all vote yes, time after time. It's so frustrating. It's, they're, you know, um, I don't know how that can keep happening. It's very frustrating. And so I'm encouraging the township committee to um, call on the county to halt the expansion into the reservation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're getting closer, Carrie. <laughs> Hi, I'm Carrie Gordon from 34 Gerard Place, and I've been going to the freeholder meetings for about a year just to talk about the ICE contract. Um, on Friday, there were 300 people protesting outside of Newark, there were 300 people in Montclair, and just to echo what Tracy said, they act with impunity. Um, it's the bluest county in a blue state, and yet we profit. Um, they're paid uh, 40 million um, with their ICE contract, and we see cheetahs and grizzly bears and sea lion displays at the zoo. And I took my kids to the zoo when they were little and um, enjoyed the little community, taking them out to walk. Um, only a few of the displays were depressing. But um, yeah, I wanted to say, like, we need to end the expansion. And it's gotten out of hand. Um, they had a public forum about a year ago. It was filled with people saying, no, don't expand. And, and we asked for a master plan. No master plan is available. 
uh, it's it's really terrible, and I and I just want to say I support you, and I support your bravery um, with the county and putting forward a resolution. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Yes. Next, Carrie. Good evening, uh, Carrie Heller, not a resident, uh, the owner representative or owner of 515 Valley Street, the map building, some of the other properties around the area. Um, if there's an opportunity for response figure, it's gonna be more in the form of a question on the mid-block crosswalks. Um, probably nobody more than me sees combination of cameras, phone calls, tenants. Um, and again, we've had discussion, if I may, when these were first put in with the town engineer, the county, I, I literally all but got arrested when they started cutting up grass, uh, tearing apart our irrigation, putting in the depressed, and, and I understand so, somewhat mandatory, but the one awkward location right opposite our front door, um, which is a T in the road, there are many T's in the road on Valley Street, um, county road, speed limit, enforcement, people crossing, um, we've discussed in possibility of, and there probably should be a 25 foot, uh, I think, distance from the crosswalk. But on the other hand, in, in creating that, in my opinion, we're gonna create an even larger problem. One of the nice things that I think goes on in Valley Street from many years ago when uh, cars really didn't park when the Hammonds owned the property, um, the street was pretty vacant. When that street has and is lacking in cars, cars go faster. When cars park, I think we all know whether it's Maple downtown or anywhere, it will slow down. You, you take away those two parking spaces on either side of the crosswalk, you can have some better sight lines, but you're also going to lose a, a little bit of the narrowness of the road. Um, I support crosswalks if it's enforceable, if the speed limit is checked, if there is other stop lines prior to. Right now, where we are in Jefferson, which I know has been discussed you know, previously, if whether there's a traffic light put there, it's an uphill, there's some awkwardness to that. But right now, between Parker and Oakland, it's a speedway. And when the, when the road is free and the road is clear, you step on the gas. The only things that slow you down are either cars turning in or out of Jefferson, which has its own share of accidents. Um, when that doesn't happen, hopefully the parallel parking is frankly what slows down cars uh, the greatest. I know this is primarily a county project, county road. It doesn't mean that we, the same way you're discussing tonight, the reservation as many other uh, towns are, and I'll have a comment if you don't shut me down on that. I can probably tell you something else on, on that that you may not know. Um, just to look at it further, consider it. I do think if it's going to be kept, the 25 foot, but to have it there mid block, and we now have the restaurant, we have the children's uh, painting um, place, um, at Lacey's uh, store, Canary. Cars are now parking across the street. Canary's probably gonna move. The restaurant's probably gonna come in front of the Board of Adjustment for variance for, for an expansion of seating. They're doing very, very well. And the cars are going to start parking more and more on the other side of Valley Street. So doing this is just going to sort of create a, um, I think, a greater attractive, I'm going to call it an attractive nuisance. Um, that's my, if I may on that, I don't know if there's any follow-up on that. From we'll the just give you, uh, we'll give you an update on it. As you know, that was not our choice to put that there. Right. Right. County's choice, the county did it, the county painted it. And we went back to the county and said, well, you've created a mid-block crossing without any safety uh, measures. And they said, well, that's up to you. So that's what we're dealing with. So I think, I, I think we're talking about putting some, you know, pedestrian signs up with the arrow down. Um, I think we are looking at... Speed limit alley is... What's our speed limit? 25. Sure. Uh, we're, we're looking at maybe pushing pushing some distance out from the the, uh, the crosswalk. I think 25 feet will knock out four spots. <clears throat> so, so we've got to figure out how to do that because uh, it's 25 feet on both sides, so you got 50 feet. Has a three-way stop ever been considered at Jefferson? No, I don't mean there, but at Jefferson? Something needs to be done to slow the vehicles down. If it's posted 25, we all know it's not 25, except you know, maybe during school hour when vehicles slow down. But we have had the, the police there um, on Valley in general because we have speeding. You know, we have a similar problem once you get past the, the country club. Um, we are putting, we got the county to put a light down there. 
I just don't think that the that it's warranted to have a light at Jefferson. It doesn't I'm have not a so much advocating as I am saying that. Believe me, we talk, talk, we talk about it every month and try to figure out because <laughs> you know we're 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 dealing with the county and we talk to the county and they say, well, this is what we're willing or not willing to do. As you know, that you guys did on Springfield Avenue, as we did in South Orange on South Orange Avenue, they said it couldn't be done to, to narrow the streets down, what was then called traffic calming. It now has other names to it. I would not rule out the possibility, subject to traffic studies, of putting other stop signs on, on Valley Street um, between Oakland and, and, and Parker somewhere. It could work. It's not that heavily trafficked by number of vehicles. It is heavily trafficked, which I I'm, I'll leave the subject and go into the YMCA and on Jefferson, having been there this morning, there is literally a disaster waiting to occur. And the police and traffic are aware of the YMCA 830 to 9. In the morning this morning, traffic was backing up onto Valley Street, both directions, that they're coming in now just from Valley, not coming in from uh, the railroad side. But yet this morning, someone coming in from the railroad side decided to make the left hand turn in and block up the traffic underneath the railroad. And then they're crossing all the little kids, the little kids on this side across Jefferson. But why doesn't want to pay for an off duty police officer? Because it's, it's you know, a minimum of four hours. On the other hand, they can't really direct traffic yet they've allowed them to put these little crossing mechanisms in the street. Hey, it takes an awful lot for a bad accident to happen. But when you're dealing with the children, whether the police themselves are out there at non-expense to, to the Y. I know they serve a benefit to the community, but it's an 8.30 to 9 o'clock in the morning issue. And it's now become an issue for us for people getting to our building. But my reason for speaking to this is more to the safety aspect. So I think there are hey, more housing, more people, more things coming uh, to the town. Jefferson and Valley is busy. You also just let me know. I'm not unclear from, from what you said, whether or not are you are you just you're straight up opposed to the mid block crosswalk the county installed i am okay. i can tell you because, absolutely yeah. from and, and by the way we encourage in fact we've just updated some of the cameras but both for the police to and they do call from time to time if they want access to our cameras we don't like when they come into our parking lot and set up the speed traps or drunk driving without asking there are other the towns among county roads throughout you know the county and they do give us they give us an indemnification and i had an you know, all but verbal altercation with the entire police force one Saturday night and coming home because it's just, it's a liability to bring drunk drivers into our parking lot without getting a hold harmless from the police department. So we encourage the police department to look at our cameras and gain access anytime they wish. And the, um, the state statute requires is a 25 foot from a crosswalk requirement as understood. you know. Um, and the standards for a stop sign or a four way stop sign freeway stop signs, since they're mostly T's, are that the traffic on each artery needs to be basically the same, right? The vehicle counts, um, which wouldn't be the case for any of those probably because Valley far exceeds the rest of them. So it's considered a through road. But we, I mean, we can do, uh, ask the county to do a traffic analysis like they did for Pearson where there's gonna be an, a signalized intersection. Um, and see if there's one warranted for Jefferson. So, there's hundreds more apartments, as we all know, right. coming and more transient, more people coming to the train stations from Irvington and West Orange. And it's only going to get worse, whatever it is that we're dealing with. I'm more concerned, one, the safety. I'm not as concerned about the business in and out for our property, but for the two stores and a couple of other small places uh, on, on Valley, it'll all but put these places out of business if we end up having 25 foot, 50 foot, or right. whatever the larger distance is. Just wanted to make that aware. Um, on the reservation, to, to the point of planning, no, there is no master plan. They don't plan. I do, I'm one of the few people that do go to the Essex County Planning Board, so to speak, meeting. There really isn't one. Um, most things are just approved, you know, to a few freeholder meetings. Um, the latest on, uh, the, call it the reservation road by the playground. Uh, you've probably seen they added another parking lot of non-paved um, stone. Um, they put a matting down. I can't tell you whether that matting was an impervious or whether it was a weed matting, but it wasn't approved. It wasn't planned. It's an overflow parking lot. It's about another acre. And certainly if it is impervious, there's stone gravel. They didn't put pavement on it, but underneath it, I happened to be there that day that they put the fabric underneath. But if it is impervious, all that water from that acre is certainly ending up you know, more immediately, not in the ground, you know, but on the road. But the larger point is that they are not planning 
Uh, they're not catching the water while we were all at you know joint meeting and Army Corps of Engineers. And I'm, I'm from Melbourne. Um, I'm, I'm the headwaters actually of the west branch of the Railway River. I own the bowling alley up at Eagle Rock, and that is the headwaters for the west branch of the river. So anything that comes into the river ends up in my building uh, in downtown Melbourne. Um, I'm also here in South Orange for the east branch. It needs to be paid attention. Uh, Joe D is doing a great job in, in many respects, but it is done after the fact. Not, not before to let all the communities, and this is not the only town, as I know you know, um, I think he's going to run into some real resistance on, on this one that I think a lot of towns are calling for. Please advise us in advance, have meetings, same way you have planning board meetings, let people come in here, uh, what the plans are. So I, I concur with those who have spoken. I just want one more thing on the stop sign. So we talk about stop sign, we talk about crosswalk, by the t and you you like the parallel park cars because it slows down traffic, narrows the road, which is true. But if we do stop signs, you also can't park within 50 foot of. I, so all of a sudden there'll be no parking. I would on rather <laughs> see that particular one, Nancy, go away. I see that as being. I've seen the police officer with the dog and trying to entrap cars. It, it's just with, with texting like that stretch of road is literally the middle of the road between Parker and Oakland. And I'm telling you, just if I may. That's the peak speed where people are hitting, and it's the midpoint of the three different streets you know, that come into that area, and it's just waiting, and I'm watching people crossing with their pizza boxes and seeing Domino's Pizza you know, offering you to get your, your money back if you, if you drop your pizza. Uh, sort, of, sort of a ridiculous thing, but if you're having to run across the street and you drop your pizza and go to pick your pizza, it's just not a great place for going to allow retail and allow the children's and allow the pizza. It's just not. I don't think that should be the crossing place. But I hear you. If it's going to be, let it be the distances. If we're going to do it, do it right or don't do it. We don't want to do it either. I do. <laughs> but if I can do anything to help as the property owner that owns a long stretch there other than the one little house, I'm happy to help. I, I'm concerned about saying this but because I don't know if it's ever going to happen. But we did work with the county and the state transportation department to do an audit or start an audit of Valley Street. And we did a walk. A team of us went south and a team went north. And so I know they walked up to Parker and beyond. And they looked at signage. They looked at crosswalks. They looked at everything, the traffic counts. And so we're supposed to have, not this year, but in 2020, some kind of audit that's going to sort of give us a big picture of Valley Street because quite honestly we've been dealing with it incrementally and piecemeal so I think the audit if it happens will give us a tool to follow like we've done with some other plans yeah last I want to say thank you we are at both our buildings over there 100 percent occupied many Maplewood residents certainly many local people some who are walking to work some have relocated from Livingston or South Orange or other places, and mostly because the town is doing what the town should be doing. The downtown you know, being wonderful, the parks, it's Maplewood Country Club. Some people I see run off with a set of golf clubs. I see people getting off the train, reverse commuting, which is certainly a newer phenomenon as we worked many years ago in South Orange to get people on the train and yelling the transit. What about people coming back the other direction? They're coming to Seton Hall instead of just going to St. Peter's. And you're just doing a, a fantastic job here in town. And anything may change in a day, a week, what I do now there with leases. Nothing is permanent when you think someone is a good paying, solid tenant. You get a phone call the next day. But for the moment in, in time and the demand uh, that we have and the people, um, we, we thank you for doing what you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else want to address the township committee? Okay, seeing no one, uh, we'll close this one. There will be another. Uh, public comment period later on. Um, let's see, we're going to go to item number six, ordinance on final. It's Mayor, uh, ordinance six, ordinance number 2962-19. It's an ordinance, chapter 239 of the Code of the Township of Maplewood. This ordinance will require that licensees maintain the sidewalks in the area of the cold weather enclosure and power wash sidewalks in the area at the end of each season. This ordinance has been published, copies posted on the bulletin board in the municipal building, and copies made available to the general public in accordance with the law. Is there anyone who would like to speak on this ordinance? 
Seeing no one will close the public hearing. Um, Mr. Daffis, can we get a motion? Certainly, Mayor. I move this ordinance be adopted as a whole and the clerk be directed to publish the same as a past ordinance in the Maplewood South Orange News Record according to law. Second. Any discussion? Who's called the roll? Ms. Adams? Yes. Mr. Daffis? Yes. Mr. Lembrick? Yes. Mr. McGeehee? Yes. Mayor DeLuca? Yes. Thank you. Another ordinance on final? Yes, item seven, Mayor, ordinance on final passage, ordinance number 2963-19. It's an ordinance to amend chapter 187 of the Code of the Township of Maplewood. This ordinance will require that licensees for outdoor cafes and patio dining maintain in the area of the outdoor dining or patio dining, power wash the sidewalks in the area at the end of each outdoor dining season. Additionally, except as otherwise permitted by law, it will remove awnings as being permitted within outdoor cafes. Mr. Daffis, can we get a motion? Uh, yes, Mayor, I move this ordinance be adopted as a whole and the clerk be directed to publish the same as a past ordinance in Maplewood South Orange News Record according to law. Second. Any discussion? Who's called the roll? Ms. Adams? Yes. Mr. Daffis? Yes. Mr. Lembrick? Yes. Mr. McGeehee? Yes. Mayor DeLuca. Yes, thank you. And we have one more on final. Also on final, uh, item number eight, ordinance number 2964-19 is an ordinance to amend chapter six of the code of the Township of Maplewood entitled Administration of Government. This ordinance will increase the number of sergeants within the Maplewood Police Department table of organization from 10 to 11. This ordinance has been published, copies posted on the bulletin board in the municipal building and copies made available to the general public in accordance with the law. Is there anyone who would like to speak on this ordinance? Seeing no one will close the public hearing. Mr. Lembrick, can we Mr. get a motion? Mr. Mayor, I move this ordinance be adopted as a whole and the clerk be directed to publish the same as a past ordinance in the Maplewood South Orange News Record according to law. Second. Discussion? For the roll. Ms. Adams? Yes. Mr. Daffis? Yes. Mr. Lembrick? Yes. Mr. McGeehee? Yes. Mayor DeLuca? Yes, thank you. We have introduction of a new one. Ms. Mayor, item nine, introduction of new ordinance, ordinance number 2965-19, is an ordinance to amend chapter 257 of the Code of the Township of Maplewood entitled Vehicles and Traffic. This ordinance will establish time limit parking of two hours on Gerard Place. Ms. Adams, can we get you a motion? I move the passage of this ordinance on first reading its publication according to law in Maplewood South Orange News Record and a hearing to be held on August 6th. I'll second. Any discussion? We've worked this out with all the residents, right? As far as I know. Please call the roll. Ms. Adams? Yes. Mr. Daffis? Yes. Mr. Lembrick? Yes. Mr. McGeehee? Yes. Mayor DeLuca? Yes, thank you. Can we have uh, discussion items? Uh, the first is the li library bond funding. Uh, I provided you with a memo last week. We had our building committee meeting and we've been looking at these draft rules, <clears throat> draft rules for the $125 million bond act. There's so much that's, that's right and good about these rules in, um, in what we do and what we hope to do. Uh, the rub is, the way they are defining project costs uh, and putting caps on the square footage really is detrimental to the, the vision that we had. So we have until August 30th to file comments. Um, I think we will, there's a few comments here, we'll have many more. Uh, and I wanted to bring it here because I wanted to see uh, what we all wanted to do as far as the township committee. I know the library board will probably file. It may be that the library foundation will, uh, and the township committee could either join those comments or file separate comments. It it might be the um, it might be more strategic to file separate, but we can figure that out. But uh, just wanted to get some comments about what people think we ought to do, um, if anyone has any other suggestions. So. Well, I do agree, Mr. Mayor, with uh, 
filing comments and separately, I think, read the document and it talks about um, the ability to show the functionality and the support uh, from other entities in town uh, regarding what were ne was needed with the platform, I think, or the library. I think this makes a lot of sense so we can talk about other organizations like Community Coalition on Race, some action, even, you know, relations with the school board and the school district, rather, to support the idea. Another thing, too, is that, you know, when you look at these comments here and, and the draft rules, it's a direct correlation. They align pretty well with the project alignment for the state priorities. It's a one-to-one -one ratio. They talk about equal access. And we know that we're trying to make sure that we have improvements so our library is accessible to all. It talks about serving public spaces and community centers. Again, our building conditions, changing that so we can actually do that. And then again, we talk about technology infrastructure. We all know that there's a, a lack of uh, ability to plug in your electronic devices in the library. We have only so many outlets, and it's an opportunity to expand that as well, uh, and also provide other computers, uh, laptops, desktops as well. Uh, and then, of course, growing the library services. I mean, you know, a library is not just a library anymore. It's a community center. And with this plan, as we will be able to do as well. So I think talking about how the draft rules um, align with us from a project perspective and with the state priorities is the narrative, in addition to all the organizations in our town that will benefit from the library. Anybody else have any comments? Mayor, I just want to clarify if we, the square footage thing and the cost per square foot of new construction versus rehab or repair um, is really concerning to me because, I mean, have we already, I mean, do we have money to even pay the architect to amend the project if necessary in order to meet certain square footage? If we reduce the square footage that, you know, brings down the cost of the project overall, obviously, but do we have that in place? Was the... No. You know, we have whatever we've, whatever the consultants have done so far, they've been paid for. Okay, so so it's we, the it's the building material. It's when they get to the building stage, writing the building specs, that they we still will have to pay them money. Right. No, I mean, it's a huge problem because if we have to reduce the square footage, then we're reducing the amount of money that would potentially come to us. Yeah. Right, which is and just a spiral we, around. Yeah, it's. And if it's somehow like, we got nailed with two hundred dollars as opposed to three fifty. Right. We would do the best we can, but. but I think yeah, and, and then are we getting clarification from um, the state as to well, definitions let's, let's, for new no, construction? Let's, let's talk about how this works. Yeah. This is a 60-day draft rule period. I know. So you, you do not get anything back. You just submit. You submit information. If you ask the, um, the state anything, they tell you, put it in the form of a response to the, a comment. They won't give you any answers. So it's like the uh, freeholder board. No back and forth. <laughs> we'll reply no, I don't to think, you. I don't think it's, no, it's just, <laughs> the, quite, it's, but, it's okay. just the process. They have to get all the, you know, they put their rules out there. They have to get comments. They have to get people to respond what they think should be changed, what they think is good, bad, and different. Um, so that's, it's not like this where you go give and take. It's, you just submit it there. No one's talking about it. The, the state library is not talking about it. They've been told not to talk about it uh, because this is the process that when you do rulemaking, you have to follow. And right. has the building, the committee talked about reducing the scale of the project, the scope of the mm -hmm. project at all in order to... Nope, because we don't know what the final rules will be. Now, so, based on this information right now, there's no definition of new construction. Right. It doesn't include... Uh, um, renovation or reconstruction, although it talks about repair and uh, rehabilitation. So I think the question is, do you, these definitions aren't defined. I think we know that if we go with an estimated 17 million, um, you know, with the 350, that's a 162 gap per square foot. A right. big gap. And that's the least case scenario, right? If you go with the 572, right. now you're getting up into like 222, 223 per square foot. So, I mean, from the numbers we have, I think that's a challenge. But I think what the mayor is asking is before we get into the numbers that we show the ability of why this makes sense for us and us for, provide our comments in with the library committee. I, 
I, Mayor, if I could jump in here. So I agree. Um, we have an opportunity here to do some advocacy in addition to uh, requesting some clarification. Uh, I have full faith and confidence that you know some of the proposed changes to the draft rules that are in the memo may be addressed, such as uh, defining reconstruction um, and some of the things that are not clarified. Um, but in terms of how they came to this square foot computation, there. There doesn't seem to be any um, any information as to how they came to right. these numbers, right. and so we have an opportunity, and I think um, we have to do it delicately and carefully because, you know, if we do this with others out there who are also, you know, going after the same pot of money, uh, you know, we sort of have there are competitors, but we we sort of have to um, create some support to say that this computation doesn't make sense if you take into consideration the additional estimated costs that go into this sort of thing. And it should be, our advocacy should be separate and apart from what the library board does, which would again underscore this idea that uh, this is a very important to us and the, munici the township committee is, and the municipality is 100% behind it. It also be a good cop, bad cop too. Sure. Whereas the library could board could take one position and the township committee. The, I, I, Mr. Humer didn't mention it. Talked a little bit about it. You know, we're asking for a significant amount. I mean, if we got what we're asking for, it would be ten percent of the, of the or eight percent of the total pot, right. which is huge to give anyone library and there are equity issues and i know what the governor's office when i spoke to the governor's office about this over the last few months and when you read the rules they are very concerned about the equity issue and making sure that um all towns all types of municipalities um have a shot at getting some of this money certainly so i understand you know their reason for wanting to stretch this but uh, you know, this is, I think we can talk about the, the goals of, of this clearly, but I think that we have to make our case because this is the, this is the only time That's it. this is around. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, all right. So we're going to, we have to August 30th, which is good because it gives us time to kick around a lot of ideas. Uh, talk to Sarah Lester, the library director, who's been in the last, uh, Couple, last week was at some meetings with library, other library directors, and really everyone's playing it very close to the vest. Sure, no one's of talking. Of course, of course. Yep. Um, but I think, I don't, I think without question, we are so far advanced uh, as far as our commitment and our, and even the plan and the vision we have. So, I think we have to fight for it. That's what this is about. One hundred. Okay. All right. So we will be back. Uh, Certainly by the next meeting, we'll have some more stuff on this and uh, air, you know, a couple sets of uh, comments. Yeah, I was just going to say, are you going to um, kick off the comments and send, distribute yep. them to us and then we'll all just add to it? Yep. Okay, next up is the shared service uh, fire department uh, joint meeting proposal. Uh, I sent you a document which essentially um, talks what a joint meeting is. Joint meeting is when any uh, more than one municipality joins together with another to provide public services, make public improvements, operate sewer authorities, things like that. So uh, in order to meet the requirements uh, that South Orange felt they had to meet as far as uh, shared management, we have agreed to look at this joint meeting as a possibility. Uh, in addition, um, it became clear to us that we were not going to be able to move this if uh, we were going to remove the South Orange firefighters from civil service um, coverage. So we have come up with a joint meeting uh, framework, which would be civil service, uh, it would have 70 firefighters, which would include one fire chief, 
deputy chief that would be an executive officer would have four deputy chiefs and captains and firefighters or what have you. Uh, there would still be three firehouses, two in Maplewood, one in South Orange. Fire apparatus would remain the same. Um, what we decided was that we, in a normal case, a joint meeting is able to own um, property, to enter into contracts, to essentially uh, tax itself or tax its members. Um, what we decided was that we wanted to make this as simple um, at an administrative level as possible. So we would not have any kind of, uh, we would not have executive director of the joint meeting or any kind of manager of the joint meeting. What we would do is contract with the two member towns. Uh, Maplewood would handle the administration and finance. South Orange would handle the personnel and human resources. And we would use, our, and um, our Maplewood uh, department, um, I'm sorry, our township administrator would be the uh, appropriate authority for the fire chief. And so what we're talking about is um, using our current infrastructure to manage the fire department in a shared way. Um, there would be a three person or three entity board uh, made up of Maplewood representatives, South Orange representatives, and then there has to be one representative that's an independent. When you have an equal number of towns in your joint meeting, you have to have a wild card. You have to have a third person. So I know that <clears throat> uh, there were issues or concerns by uh, members of the township committee about going in this direction. So I want to put this out there. Uh, if we can, I spoke to uh, Vice, uh, Vice uh, Village President um, Sheena Collum, and we would like to put forth a, uh, a resolution that would be similar for both towns uh, that would say that we're moving uh, in the direction of establishing the joint meeting. We were looking to actually f establishment, establishment, establish it sometime in November and have it functioning, or even October, and have it functioning in uh, January 1st. A um, couple of issues that we've been talking to our uh, partners with the governor's office, the czars. Uh, there's an employee recognition plan that has to get addressed. We wanna make sure that the people that we're gonna be bringing into the academy this month or next month will be able to be transferred over to the joint meeting. Uh, essentially, both fire departments, all the personnel gets transferred to the joint meeting and they all work for the joint meeting. Um, there's a piece on the law that you have to be vested for one year in order to have that protection. So we would need a waiver from either the Civil Service Commission or the governor's office. So we've put it on the czars to get that waiver for our people, or at least figure out the structure that would uh, be necessary. Uh, we're asking for legal assistance from DCA to um, help us establish the joint contract and the bylaws. Um, we are uh, looking at uh, some other issues, just uh, what has worked well in other uh, joint meetings in general, or the couple of uh, fire department joint meetings, one of which is in North Bergen, or North Hudson, and one is a couple of volunteer departments. And then we are looking at the $10 million that was just put into the state budget for shared service opportunities to see if we can get some significant funding to help with our transition, uh, to deal with some training of our current personnel. As you might imagine, we have standard operating procedures for our two different fire departments. We have apparatus, which is different. Uh, so we would need to get some cross training. We would need to do rebranding. We have to put new logos and emblems on uh, fire, fire trucks and hats and, uh, and um, new firehouse signs and things like that. We might have some buyouts of firefighters we want to talk about, legal services, insurance coverage. So we're going to make a push to get some of that new money that's there for um, shared services to see if they would help us with the transition. So we're, we're pushing this back. Uh, we've said to the state all along 
that we're willing to go with a joint meeting. Uh, we're willing to consider a joint meeting, rather. Uh, but it has to be a no cost or little cost, and there has to be savings. Um, so that's, that's where we are. We believe that the state FMBA, the local FMBAs, the Firemen's Mutual or Firefighters Mutual Benefit Association, um, will uh, be supportive of this direction. So we think we can put all the parties together and make this happen. Uh, it's going to take a lot of work. It's going to take a, um, a good deal of work between now and the end of the year to, to do this. Uh, but that's where we are. And when do we get an idea of the savings? Say that again. When do we get an idea of what the savings will be if we go with this? Well, we'd have to do the, when we find out exactly who's coming over, uh, who's not retiring, it's quite possible that there would be people who would retire, so we'd have to take a look at their salaries. Um, but I think going early on, we would have some sense of what the numbers are. Decide what our individual and collective bottom line is once we get some numbers, yeah. like whether or not it's worth it. Right. In the end, and then, you know, there's a short-term savings and there's longer-term savings right. because we think that over time, uh, the joint meeting could uh, find efficiencies, uh, also sh uh, do some joint purchasing, so mm -hmm. we wouldn't have to have two of everything. Is there any chance that it would end up event long term costing more? Uh, is it possible? Um, you know, these things as you go out, well, this is a 10 year contract. So it's probably not because you're always going to have people retiring at the higher end and hiring lo uh, newer people at the at, um, a lower end of salary. So it's probably going to balance out. I think the most savings we're going to get is up front. I think there are firefighters who probably don't want to do this and go through this and just want to leave. So we'll probably see the most savings now. And then um, that will be, as long as we keep it at 70 now, we're above 70 with uh, the two departments. So there's some savings there in just reducing folks. There's one chief that gets uh, not uh, carried forth. So there are some savings there. So, and Chief, I mean, Mayor, you mentioned uh, personnel, but also equipment and operations. I think once we get this going, we're going to find some great cost savings once we get into the weeds in terms of how we operate our fire department versus South Orange. And then also, who's to say that this won't grow, that other towns might join us? Yeah. I, there you I, go. So there's opportunities. I see all those upside. Well, police and fire are always the most expensive parts of the municipal budget, as we all, we all know. Um, so every year there's more toys and trucks that are, <laughs> it seems to go down even, even though tired and younger, I mean, it all has been happening the same way, just relevant savings. So, but let's remember that the primary goal here is delivering better services. We will now have the ability to have more firefighters automatically deployed than we have right now. Right now, we basically have to wait for a second re Alarm. redeployment yeah, by right. mutual aid. Now we will have, I mean, they talk about, you know, some number in the high teens of being at a fire. So you can have people inside, people outside doing all the different things. So we'll be able to, to, to meet some of those standards by having um, a minimum of 14, a maximum of 17 on a shift to be able to go out to a fire. And then the other part is our firefighters are required to have EMS yes. and South Orange Rescue Squad takes over that responsibility in South Orange. So how it, this has still got to be worked out, right? Yep. That's, that's one of the hardest things. Um, we do bring in about $350,000 a year in uh, fees, is that correct, uh, ambulance fees? So that helps uh, helps us be able to maintain that. But um, that is a problem. It's, it's a problem just, you know, you have one department and you have one town that's uh, a different firefighter than the other town, but we're, we're going to continue to work that out. That's all we put that on the table is that's, uh, that has to be there. So. So that is non-negotiable. Yep.
So um, well, that was easy. <laughs> yeah. So what I'd like to, you know, uh, suggest is that I will get a resolution out. I'll work with Raj, with Mr. Desiderio, and get a resolution out, and um, we'll take a look at it and see if we can vote on it at the next meeting. It'll basically be more of a plain vanilla as to uh, two towns are willing to pursue the establishment of a joint meeting, blah, 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 this kind of thing. Yeah, Mr. Mayor, I mean, I just wanted to say for the record, I mean, I support the combination of the two fire departments. It would have been my strong preference, uh, one, that we uh, that we be able to do it the way it was initially proposed and I thought agreed upon by the two towns, uh, that we would do the merger uh, without a joint meeting. Uh, I, I don't think this is the, uh, the most efficient uh, way to do this, but I understand there are uh, political realities uh, that are not necessarily being driven by fact, but are driven more by uh, fear and paranoia that are the same reasons why it's so difficult to have shared services and shared school districts and, uh, and other things in New Jersey and, uh, you know, is, is the reason why uh, taxes around the state can never go down. But uh, the, the other thing I'm disappointed in is that we're going to have to be a civil service uh, department uh, in talking to uh, elected officials and people who work in local government around the state. I have had many people from civil service municipalities tell me how much they envied Maplewood not having civil service and how jealous they were. And I have never uh, said back to them that I felt the same, that, that I envied uh, them being in a civil service jurisdiction. I, I, don't think it's, I don't think it's a good way to run a department, but uh, again, I guess the political reality is that if we want a combined department, we have to go civil service. I think the pros still outweigh the cons, so despite my disappointment, I will swallow hard and, and vote for it, but I think uh, better was possible here, and I thought better was the direction we were going, uh, but I guess we will have to settle for good. So, thanks. Mr. Mayor, there was a, a presentation by civil service uh, to our department. I think it was last month, is that right? Yes. And can you tell us a little bit about how that went and if there was any further insight? Um, I, well, what they reported to us, we were not there, but what the union reported to us, a civil service came to Maplewood, a representative, to speak to our, our bargaining unit, our firefighter bargaining unit. And what was reported to us is that people were, the firefighters were positive about uh, being uh, covered by civil service. Um, they had some questions about being able to transfer their current status over and that's what we're working on they had concerns about if someone becomes uh, a captain in november they won't have a year in so what would happen that's why we need these waivers uh, and of course the new people coming on they had questions about the emt how that would work we've looked at the uh, job job titles that we have and civil service has and part of what we're asking the state czars to do now is to have somebody from civil service sit down with our people and go over person by person to make sure that we can match. come up with, yeah, match the job description and, and then go forward with it. They wanna make sure that, and I think the state union wants to make sure there's no loss in pension coverage, no right. loss in hospitalization coverage, because they're essentially going from two employees. Maplewood is one employee, and South Orange to one is employee, to a new employee, which is the joint meeting. Right. So we gotta make sure that there's that's not considered a break in coverage, so that they lose all that, you know, the pension. Now, if you move from um, Maplewood to go to Scotch Plains, you're still covered in the pension system, so it should not be a problem. Um, and then they were also co uh, concerned about the, the collective bargaining agreement. Our hope is that we can have a collective bargaining agreement on the Maplewood side done before the end of the year. All right. All right. 
but there's still you know more to talk about with them and uh but they have partners they're at the meetings now and the cap the uh chiefs will be at the meetings our next meeting is in the beginning of august and uh our lawyers are at the meetings now so that makes it interesting um all right thanks for the update uh, the next item is the 2020 census so congratulations everybody we didn't have the uh citizenship question put into the census really wanted that, uh so one of the things that i'd like to do is to get going in september uh put together a group that would um start focusing on the 2020 census uh, and so if you have names of people that you would like to see involved let me know what we did last time is we put together a group of people. We had some meetings. We kind of mapped out a strategy as who we wanted to um, sort of reach out to to make sure that they were uh, doing the census. We worked a lot with the census. We gave away a lot of crap, uh, bags and hats and all kinds of mugs and everything, but it worked. We uh, had a very high return here in Maplewood. So Do you want to give out crap again? I don't know about that. But. <laughs> Um, so that's, that's uh, if, again, if you have people, um, I would just say that I know, you know, people say we're two towns and all that stuff, but we really ought to focus on Maplewood because the stakes are just so very high. Um, we got to get make sure that Maplewood, uh, the people who live in Maplewood respond and our interest and efforts should be on getting uh, Maplewood people to register with the census. How big is this committee going to be? I don't think it's more than 12. 12 people? Yeah, 11 or 12. It's workers. A lot of workers because it's standing outside supermarkets. It's, you know, going to groups. Now, one thing, I, I guess, the census this year, a lot of it's going to be over the Internet. People are going to be able to fill out their – it's not going to be stuff mailed. Or if it, whatever's mailed, I guess it's going to have a link that you go online and do it. So um, we're going to have to make sure that – we're, we're getting people aware that it's coming, but we'll know when those things, what we did last time is we knew the mail weekend when the census forms were coming out. I think we were at the train station, we were around town. So that's all the kinds of stuff that we do. I will just have to like, I have technology, we can bring portable laptops and MIFIs and. Oh, yeah, well, the library, the library will play a big role in that too. I was knocking on doors. Okay. Uh, number five, Ms. Adams, the development in South Mountain Reservation. Yes, Mayor. Thank you. I, um, as we heard from uh, citizens who came out to speak in public comment today, this is an issue that um, concerns all, all of us, I think. Um, as everyone might remember, I did contact the county when the uh, parking deck was being constructed. I was worried that they were expanding the footprint. I was assured that it was a very small expansion of the footprint of the existing. I can't really say it much better than what everybody spoke about tonight. Um, the forest management learning center incorporating, as um, Kelly Quirk, who emailed us earlier, um, the idea of just having a learning center in the existing reservation in nature and and doing it that way and utilizing what's already there instead of building something completely new. Store the things I said to uh, the freeholders when I went to the meeting on July 10th was everything, a lot that's been st stated tonight and specifically the environmental impact, the um, uh, stormwater runoff, which statewide is an issue of stormwater management plans we're dealing with it here in Maplewood as you guys all know so um, the traffic impacts the traffic's already increased dramatically along there the um, money making pro where the money is going and why the zoo is not profitable with all that's being done um, the transparency is a huge issue um, the chair of the green team Tracy Woods uh, drafted uh, a resolution draft for us to, um, if we are all in support of sending the county our opinion on this, um, 
I can read that to you as it's drafted now, or I, we can just discuss this first and see if there's a consensus to notify the county formally of our opposition to the constant expansion at the zoo reservation. Um, I'm happy to weigh in next. Uh, I mean, I have been uh, both as a private citizen and I think as an elected official, uh, a big supporter of the zoo. Uh, I've gone uh, at the county's invitation to a number of, of the ribbon cuttings and opening ceremonies and celebrations at the zoo. Uh, my family has absolutely adored the zoo. Uh, and, um, you know, in the past there have, you know, there, there have been, I think, less opposition, but some opposition to some of the projects. Uh, and I have felt that the county was doing the right thing, and I really like the progress the zoo has made. I think at this point, it's it's going too far. Um, and uh, I think the the current uh, proposals, the the eight million for the, the the amphitheater, the sixteen million for the bears, uh, it's it's all just too much. I, I think we have, you know, already such an outstanding zoo. Uh, and I think, you know, it's one of the things our county already does really well, but I think our county has, has other gems or potential gems that could you, where we could use this money and where this money could be better spent. Uh, and, you know, it's, if, if you focus on, you know, if you do one thing well, that's great and you want to keep that up and don't lose that, uh, but start looking at other things that maybe you don't do as well or that, or that could use funding. Uh, and I think one of the, uh, real, uh, the real uh, deficit in, in this community, whether you consider this community all of Essex County or, or Maplewood, uh, South Orange, West Orange, this area of the county in particular, is the lack of open space. I mean, I, I wish we had more open space to work with. When we talk about, um, you know, the lack of a place to put uh, additional sports fields, the lack of a place to put a dog park, uh, the, the lack of, uh, of trails and other places for people to enjoy the outdoors uh, in this area, the idea that we would, we would take away more from what we have and with all of the things that, that our area needs to spend money on and devote our resources to, uh, this is just a, a bridge that's too far for me. Uh, so I would agree with the comments that my colleague, Ms. Adams, has put forward, and I would support uh, a resolution by this body to uh, strongly urge uh, our colleagues on the uh, County Board of Freeholders uh, to, to reconsider moving forward with these projects and even spending open space trust fund money uh, on plans for these projects. Uh, because again, if, we, if we're not gonna do the project uh, we shouldn't spend money on the plans. And once we go forward, I feel like it's going to be really hard to stop the train. Uh, once we've spent a lot of money on plans, it's going to be, well, you know, do are, are we pot committed? And I, I don't want us to get to that point. Uh, and I think the, the public outcry is there. And I think I'm a good example, actually, of the fact that the public outcry is not coming from just the usual people who oppose expansion at the zoo or oppose county projects. Uh, this is one where, uh, you know, I'm really reversing course from where I usually end up on these things. And I, I just think it's clear this one's, this one's going too far. So I agree with Ms. Adams. Oops. I think we're all in favor. I mean, I don't want to speak for anyone else. I, I would be in favor of a resolution opposing further development in the reservation. Um, I echo previous remarks, and I particularly echo what was said by our notable local activists um, you know, this evening during public comment. Uh, the reservation is our jewel. We're really fortunate to have it and to keep hacking at it and taking it away. Uh, for these uh, vanity projects, which is what they are, uh, especially in light of public sentiment, majority public sentiment against it, it is really, really uh, 
not serving our community needs. I could think of so many social services that we could meet that we're not meeting right now. Uh, most notably, homelessness in Essex County. Homelessness in Essex County. Let's put some money into that, okay? Uh, and not into another vanity project um, at, at when the impact is so devastating to the reservation and the environmental uh, impacts that come with it. So I would oppose further development. I would also call to action for greater transparency to the public uh, about how these funds are being appropriated and how they're being spent for these sort of things. Thank you, Ms. Adams, for leading us on this. I'll just say one thing. And this project doesn't benefit the greater good of the, of the, of the county. That's the bottom line. And there, all, for all those who are aware of it, there's 80% who are not. And if they heard this, their eyes are rolling the back of their head. So I think we're all set. Yeah, and I, I think Mr. Davis just made a great point that, you know, I mean, while, while the open space funds can't necessarily be used to provide for certain social services, you know, the the, the eight million or sixteen million that's, that's going to go into I these meant. projects, yeah. you know, the, the idea that you know that that we have a homelessness issue, for example, in Essex County, that we're not providing habitats for people who live here, but we want to spend tens of millions of dollars on habitats for bears and other animals that don't want to be here. Um, <laughs> uh, it just, yeah, it, it, it seems like, you know, th this is all just going too far. So uh, I think we have to, uh, I, I would agree with the priorities. I always think it's been a problem with the county in that there are a number of uh, projects that should be taken, um, they, sh they should be doing, and they haven't been doing that. I am a little concerned about saying, you know, no development in the pro in the reservation because I think that's I don't know what that means. Um, you know, we had we had five speakers, three of them said no to the zoo expansion, two of them said that there needs to be more transparency and more of a uh, plan, some kind of planning. So uh, I don't know what the resolution says, what the proposed resolution says, but. Um, if we were talking about that the break should be put on this until there can be an overall plan that's presented to the public and be debated and people can decide what to do, then I'd be in favor of that. If it was just a flat out no development in the reservation, I don't know what that means. Does that mean you can't? I mean, I, to be honest, I was in a meeting with the people from Milburn and the county executive and um, somebody who was in this room has, was indicated that they support uh, putting, uh, expanding a parking lot because of the amount of hikers, they don't have a place to park. So is that considered expansion? Is that considered development? Uh, I actually have been um, quite surprised about the use of that the stupid swan park area there. Um, <laughs> Well, the pirate playground is awesome. Well, okay, so you know, and I am I'm amazed at how many people use that playground next to where the swans are. And um, is that development? Yeah, there's also development. They put a walking park around the Orange Reservoir. So I'm a little concerned about saying no development. I'm more interested in saying let's have a plan. Let's not spend money at this point. Let's vet these projects. Uh, to be honest, I would disagree with that the majority of people, the majority of people don't know anything about this plan. But there are a lot of people that use that facility up there now. A lot of schools get bust um, from places, and, and this is their only green space. <clears throat> so it's the zoo, it's the, it's the reservation, it's the playground, it's a safe place. They don't have safe places where they live. So I, I think we have to look at it as a much broader thing. Um, and I'm not a big supporter of all these parks and, and the county executive's picture on all this stuff. But I do think that uh, if we're going to say something, we ought to say that there needs to be more transparency, there needs to be a break uh, put on this uh, the movement of these funds and this expansion, and uh, that there needs to be a plan as to how we're going to uh, make the reservation the best it can be. I, and I, I agree with all that. I, I would not be in favor of sort of a blanket saying, you know, no, you know nothing, not, don't, don't change anything or no, right. no development. But uh, I certainly think the current projects that are proposed, I, I'm, I just don't see, uh, 
don't see a reason to support those. And uh, and I agree, we, we need more public disclosure. We need more public input uh, and more planning for future well, projects. So uh, everything the mayor just said, I would right. I would agree with. Just a couple points on that. I can either read this um, beginning draft that I have several bullets that I would add to it, including transparency and um, or I can just circulate it or send it to to Mr. Desiderio and then have it circulated and um, for approval by the whole township committee. Okay. Um, one thing I, I do want to say is that there have been several OPRA requests and several just requests because it's public information for a master plan that is supposedly um, the county freeholders have adopted and it is not anywhere online and requests to have it were forwarded to the secretary of the board of freeholders who has not provided it um, either over the course of the last week. Um, so there's a lot of doubt, thus the transparency issue. There's a lot of doubt as to whether or not it even exists. Um, it certainly, you would think, be something that somebody could dig up and out. Most master plans are approved and, but you know, the clerk, clerk and everything else. So it's, um, there's been a lot and I, I I do agree about, you know, we can be very careful about saying that we don't want any development. The reality is that, like, if there's more parking needed, for example, Mayor, it can be a pervious surface, not blacktop. You know, it can be done in ways that don't interfere. A lot of this open space money, think of the number of trees that could be reforesting um, the South Mountain Reservation right now if we put that money toward that and using using the space for an actual nature outdoor learning center, which is thing. And to your point, Mayor, the, um, the green space that many, many people in Essex County, many schools go to is, this is exactly what we're worried about, is that green space disappearing to more formula, formalized learning space, if you will. So, um, Thank you for uh, all your comments, and I'll move forward with Mr. Desiderio on this tomorrow. Okay, thank you. Do we need a vote, or are we going to pass the resolution? No, it'll be a resolution August 6th. August 6th, yeah. Unfortunately, but there was a lot there, so. Uh, Mr. McGee, tracking code enforcement actions and projects. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I wanted to bring to discussion with my colleagues the fact that um, we have residents that um, put in uh, complaints, if you will, about certain activity in our community, be it cutting your hedges, uh, not cutting your grass, things that basically violate code. Trees. And one of the things that um, brought to my attention is that there's, once they put those in, that not really a formal way to track these pro this process. I know we have the SDL portal, but you know and it's up and coming, but there really hasn't been a way for a resident to get in real time where that is in terms of the priority in the list. And I wonder what we can do to enhance that line of communication between our residents and our, our code enforcement. So I'm going to jump in here because we just talked about this earlier this week at code enforcement. Uh, or it was last, last week. week yeah. yeah. Uh, the days are all sort of merging into the same day. Uh, so yeah, we have uh, certainly been increasing increasing our enforcement of property violations throughout town on the residential side and on the commercial side uh, and we thank our new community development director Annette De Palma for her leadership in that regard um, and you're absolutely correct Deputy Mayor McGeehy that there is no way currently of closing the loop unless one of us knows about something and we find out from code enforcement from one of our inspectors that the issue has been abated and then we get back to the resident and it becomes a very inefficient uh process so we've talked about this recently at our last meeting how do we engage our technology to help us in this as you noted uh, publicly here tonight, we have a new portal called the SDL 
spatial data logic, which has been very valuable for our code inspectors in being able to digitize these complaints and the summonses that go out and tracking progress. The remaining thing that hasn't been done is closing that loop, getting back to the resident that the issue that they uh, reported using SDL when SDL is being used, that the issue has been abated. So we had a conversation, uh, Mr. Palma was going to reach out. I'm going to invite our township uh, assistant uh, administrator momentarily to speak further about this because he also has been working very closely on this issue. So we're, we're talking with SDL to see if we could um, create that notification. Uh, it's a combination of educating our residents to when they sign up and they log in for SDL the first time to um, indicate that they want to receive those notifications and it's also a question of having the system provide you with the notification automatically so that you don't have to actively go in there to find it. The same way that Facebook notifies you that you have a new message or someone liked your post without you having to actively pursue that. So that is where we are with that. And I welcome uh, Ms. Riveros and or our township administrator assistant administrator, excuse me, to uh, speak further about this. Glenn, is there anything you'd like to say? Certainly. Uh, so, uh, Glenn Would you Miklowski, introduce yourself, yeah, Glenn? Glenn Miklowski, assistant township administrator. Um, so a year ago when this rolled out, um, we've reached the point where it's kind of, uh, there's a three part answer to that question. One. The process needs to be reinforced from leadership down to the rank and file so that those loops do close. And when they do close, um, there's an administrative setting that will turn on that each time there is something changed in the audit trail, it will send out that message. And then the third part is the resident has to opt in to that message. So they have to go into their settings on the app and go, I want all this information. I want text. I want emails. And it, it's, it's, it's a learning process. It's reinforcing the process and the culture. And I think once all three of those kind of come together and we increase awareness for the, the portal and the app, that you'll, you'll see less and less of that. It'll start to drop off. But again, last week when we had this conversation, it was brought to our attention. I, I dug into the settings. So right now, anyone who reports a complaint on spatial data logic, as long as they opt in and as long as it's closed out administratively, will receive a notification for every step of that process. So complaint received, complaint accepted, complaint closed, and any notes that the inspectors put in the in the file. Right. So previous previous to now, those notification settings were turned off. Right. And now they're turned on. Correct. And can you walk us through how that notification works? So I just reported that the the hedges next door uh, my neighbor next door needs to cut them because it's creating a traffic issue, right? Right. Uh, take, walk me through it. Sure. So um, our community development director will receive an email uh, notifying her that a complaint has come, come into the system. She'll manually assign that to one of the code inspectors to abate the issue or issue a summons. As long as the code inspector closes that out in the system, the person who initially reported the the violation will receive emails throughout the process. And then finally, when it's completed, you'll receive an email that it was closed out and any notes that the inspectors put in through the process. Right, so that there's two things there that we really need to focus, laser focus on. Number one is what we talked about with Mr. Palma is a notification going out from our office acknowledging receipt. So as long as they correctly assign the complaint, it should generate that message. So it's, it's a process thing. So if it can be assigned to one of the code inspectors, but if they don't click that button that assigns a tracking number to it, it's in our system internally, but then it doesn't trigger the, the external notification. Right. Mr. Daffis, let me ask one question. So you said though the resident themselves have to opt into the communication. 
they will receive the initial one by default, but there are additional settings they can opt into, yes. So then- Like any, any pending changes throughout the process? Like, so the initial complaint, they'll get an email. Okay. The resolution, they'll get an email. If they want anything in between, like, uh, I visited the site, this is still pending, any notes that get put in, they have to opt into that additional information because some people may not want that. Got it. So do they opt into the rest of the process through a link on the email or do they have to go to the internet? When they open the app or the portal on the website, they go to their settings and there's a notifications tab. Yeah. They can click text, email, uh, in-app notification and... In the, in the copy in the email, do we specify to that resident that to find out more information, please go in and opt in now? That would have to be manually put in by either the community development director or the inspector in the so, notes. So then the email is basically, it's a template. That it's a template, have. but they can fill in as much or as little as they want. So then we could, so Mr. Palmer could actually add that copy into the email moving forward so that the resident, when they receive the email saying we received the complaint, now we've communicated them proactively. If you want to hear more information, go to your sit opt in and then. Right, Beca right. Because the ticker is not automatic, like right. say Facebook, yep. that needs to be part of the message. And that is what we talked about with our community development director. That A, it would say, it would be an acknowledgement receipt and also an, a quick education piece saying, this is currently being assigned. The way it works is, we, we do a notice, and if it's not taken care of, then we issue a summons. Because that's another piece here, is that the residents don't understand, well, I just reported this the other day, why isn't it taken care of yet? And right. please opt in to, for future communication. And opt in right. to all the notifications that are possible. Right. right. Go to your portal right. and opt in. And SDL is usually happy to provide us with like marketing materials and flyers, so they periodically give me you know, guides for residents on how to sign up and we right. kind of- But the big picture here is, um, we can get into the weeds of the notifications, but the issue is we all have to do our part, all of us have to do our part to educate our residents to use SDL. Yep. Uh, the mobile app is particularly good in, in terms of its, its interfacing is very user friendly as opposed to uh, the desktop. desktop. Uh, or the laptop version. So, you know, when someone reaches out to us, we need to say, hey, listen, let me walk you through SDL. I'm happy to help. I'm happy to follow up for you. But let's take this step so that they can start getting used to the idea of using this because otherwise we're never going to get people out of it. Uh, the other thing that, the other reason why this is important is because currently we have two avenues that residents can use. Uh, on their own digitally to report things. They can do a regular complaint right. uh, through the website, a citizen's complaint about anything, not just property maintenance, or they can use, and they can use SDL. And I think what we've talked about in communication subcommittee and in other committees, down the road, what we'd like to do is to get everyone using SDL exclusively. Yep because it does allow us to report other things. Yeah, we've already moved away from the, the one that Civic Plus provides, so it's all SDL now on the website. Uh, now where they used to go, it'll just show a staff directory, so if they really need to call us, they can, the phone number's there, email's there, but that old complaint system's no longer being used. Right. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I still Good. can't get in. Good. Okay. Uh, Mr. Daffis, alcohol consumption policy in the parks. Thank you, Mayor. Um, yes, so this is about alcohol consumption in, pub in public parks, not in public uh, buildings or other public township property, and only as associated with event applications. This is something that came out of code committee, um, code enforcement last time. Um, I think you had walked out r right you know, you had just walked out, I think, Mayor, you were not able to stay for the entire meeting. Um, and the idea here is to uh, have a, a, a policy. Um, and let me explain. Uh, you could say, Mayor, that we have a policy right now. We say that there's no alcohol consumption in public parks allowed as per our ordinance. Uh, and that is true, but it's also not true. It's a myth because we know that we allow uh, alcohol consumption in public parks. Uh, 
as associated with event applications for one particular very successful and very trademark event for our township, which we all experienced this past weekend. Actually, I was away out of town this time and did not experience it, but you all did. Um, and we don't allow it for any other events. And, and so the recommendation that came out of code enforcement is to have a consistent policy where we enumerate the what, what that would look like. We're not talking about every family picnic. We're talking about event applications. And perhaps we could follow the prescriptions of the social affairs permit uh, that ABC, the state ABC uses where it outlines, you know, this, do you have insurance? Do you have this? Are you basically prepared? Do you have security? Um, is your event such an event that you can ensure that it's going to go off well? We're not going to have any issues. Uh, that was the recommendation that came out of code enforcement. So I'm presenting it all here to you all um, to see if there's any support to move forward with a specific policy. So I'm sorry I left because I would have vigorously opposed this. And I would actually, if it was, if you want to make the case that because we allow one group to use it, we should let others use it, then I would vote not to let Maple Woodstock have a beer garden anymore. I think this is a huge slippery slope. I think that um, but we can we we could prescribe that. So it's and not how do you do that? You 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 outline and you force people to come before us and ask for permission, like the other event does. So and okay, we make so, that determination. So uh, so uh, what about a group who doesn't sell? That they're selling beer and wine. What about a, a a softball team that wants to have an event application? at Dehar Park, and then after the last game of the season, have alcohol there. Right. That's allowed? Well, if it That's met the requirements that we put together. There's also strict uh, parameters that are put on Maple Woodstock Committee, for example. The, where the alcohol is has to be cordoned off. There's police presence. Public there's, safety stuff, yeah. Um, there's check, people checking valid IDs and wristbands and stamps and all that kind of stuff. So there is, it's, I don't think that's an equivalent thing. My, my concern, as Mr. Davis stated, is just what do we, we could be easily challenged on the fact that we do, if we permit one group to do it, but other groups ask the same thing and maybe follow the same parameters to a certain extent, we could even limit number we allow or whatever it just it feels inconsistent and I think I th I'm just longing for some consistency in, in the policy I would go with the consistency of none I just think you are you are not going to be able to find now, first of all no one's going to challenge us this is a fundraising event the reason they came to us and when we approved this we made it very clear that this was not going to be a blanket or approval for other parks no one has made it. I, the question I have for you is, who do you say no to? Not who do you say yes to, but who do you say no to? I think you, you, provide, you consider each application on its own. You have to have a rational basis to say Sure, no. and a rational basis would be based on the parameters, that, that everyone would be subject to the same parameters. But it's right different. now, we have something in our events application that says, please see our township clerk but we, it actually says, it, it, it references our, our ordinance that says there's no alcohol permitted in our parks. In our in public buildings either. Right. Uh, well, I want to distinguish this right. from the social affairs permit, which... Well, that's not what that is. You know, Go ahead. But, you know, we don't allow this, but if you want to have an event, please see our township clerk. And sometimes these things are categorically denied behind the scenes. And sometimes they're not, you know, for a long time, um, Maple Woodstock had to come before us. Uh, there weren't, there wasn't a majority support for their having a beer garden either. And also- was, No, that's wrong. There was majority support. There wasn't a universal- There was, was a, a unanimous, unanimous majority. Uh, unanimous support is right. what I meant to say. Okay. Yes, excuse me. I should be more precise with my language and thank you. Uh, 
Yeah, so, so, you know, this is an equity issue. I think that, you know, we have policies, we're professional, we should have, I think, my position is that we should have parameters about what's allowed and what's not and how someone's application would be considered. Uh, and currently, it only applies, it's good for one event and it's not good for other events. And, you know, the other thing is, if we want to be technical about it, we also know that despite the beer garden and the prescriptions, uh, you know, that applied to Maplewood stock, we know that people are consuming visibly, openly uh, alcohol outside of the beer garden. Uh, we know that people are consuming alcohol and we welcome them to do so when they go to that park and other parks for, for public concerts. And we don't say anything about it right so so where's the consistency there how are we in for we have this ordinance that sort of applies in some instances if it's a township sponsored event and we like that event if it's a success, successful event or a trademark event and it doesn't apply to others in other instances we say categor categorically not we're not even going to review your application can I get some clarification on, on a point from either Ms. Fritzen or Mr. Desiderio? Um, and that's each year Maple Woodstock Committee comes to us and my understanding is they request permission from us to apply to the state for some sort of, for like a one day like, can you just explain that process? I just like, I want to understand what it is that we, it's been a few months. What is it that they come to us to They come to us to, to ask for a waiver from the no alcohol ban and asking for us to give them permission to sell beer and wine. For, but from, from whom do they get the, the, the that, license? At that point, they then have to go to whatever the next state. entity is. Right. And but is it the state ABC? They, can I speak for one second? Um, the social affairs permit, they have to have that to um, do what they did this past weekend. But there's a big hurdle when they apply, they have to be a nonprofit. You cannot just be a group that applies for a social affair permit. You must be a bona fide and have proof of that that you're a nonprofit. So that does knock out a lot of organizations that file an event application and want to have liquor in the park. Right. I mean, so again, you know, and you know the social affair permit is a permit that they must get through the state of new jersey abc um before they can even come forward to the township committee asking for a waiver and there are strict requirements in that application absolutely those are state requirements correct absolutely so it starts at the state and then comes to us essentially at that point excuse me it starts at the state and then comes to us you're saying okay. for example well, maple woodstock I, I, don't think, I, don't, I don't think that's correct there would be absolutely no reason for a nonprofit group to go get a state permit if we're not going to provide them with that. So right. it has so to start I, I with us. I want to understand the process. It starts yeah. with us, it has to then, start with us. then okay. we require them to get a social affairs permit. Correct. And then we also require them to follow the directive directions of the Maplewood Police Department, Maplewood Fire Department, and all the de relevant departments for not only Beer Garden, but also the event as a whole. So okay. there's ongoing coordination, especially for an event of that size. So if an organization basically copycat what Maple Woodstock does, then we, then technically we should allow them to do it yep. as well. Right now you have a process that they come before you on an ad hoc basis to make that application, which any applicant can do. And that's, I think that's what's the issue. This the issue thing. of enforcement, with all due respect, Mr. Davis, has absolutely nothing to do with what you're saying. If we don't enforce the law in the park about about alcohol, that's an issue to take, bring up with the police chief. Okay, I mean the fact we're not tacitly acknowledging or, or accepting that fact. I think we still believe it's prohibited, and we want the police to enforce it. So I don't think that's that's relevant to the issue that you're that you're bringing up respectfully. I think it's part of the overall picture. And, and we don't, ha we don't allow people, there have been events that have been filed that were categorically denied before they reached this body. I'm sorry, there, there were, there were events that were filed. There filed. were events filed right. in the public park right. 
in, in Memorial Park to be right. specific, with beer and wine right. that were denied before they reached this governing body. Right. And, and, and it's been the policy of this governing body generally to not have these applications come before it on a regular basis because it's really not the business of this governing body to deal with those regularly. That's what your staff is for. Your, your, your policy, again, respectfully, is to set policy, not to have people come before you and ask you if they can, if they can park or all these other things, okay? If that's what you want to do, you're certainly entitled to do that, but I think that your time is better served doing other things, quite frankly. Right, but you said our policy right now is you, that we have everybody come before us. I'm saying you can entertain them if you wish, okay? And right now we have one applicant who comes, all right, that I recollect. I recollect none others, all right? And they seek leave, okay, from that, all right? If you want to entertain these applications, but I believe you said it right when you started, there is a policy, and that policy is that alcohol is prohibited in the parks. It's, there's a practice. I don't it's think a there's a policy. No, that's an Because I don't think it's a policy that applies across the board. Mr. Desideria, you know, because you've been to these events yourself, sir, with all due respect to you as well, where, you know, even though alcohol is not permitted, it was permitted, it was allowed. And yes, that's an enforcement issue, and that's also a different conversation. But of course, it relates to this. I have never been to an event. You've never I been to a concert. I I have never, no, I have never been to an event where, where alcohol was permitted when it was illegal. All right. And if I had seen it, I would have called the police. All okay. Right? Interesting choice of words. Public. Look, I don't want to argue with you, Mr. Desdari. I'm just, I, I heard what you had to say and I'm replying to what you said. And now I open it up to my colleagues to hear from them. So I think the issue is we have an ordinance that says no alcohol is allowed in the parks. The other part of that ordinance says in our municipal buildings, in government, with the exception of... I'm going to take, I'm going to respond to you because I believe our ordinance says except those buildings that are specified. There is a series of buildings that are specified where it is permissible. Okay. That's but, but fine. But that's with a social affairs permit. Right. Right. It, it, the, the social affairs permit is required regardless. But on our end, um, clearly, it's a, clearly at Woodlands, it's it's permitted. I, I didn't. I thought when we looked at the ordinance at code enforcement, it didn't list the buildings. I was hoping it would. I didn't. The I ordinance. No, it does. Ones. It does. The ordinance lists the buildings. It's 1978. Bergdorf. It's Bergdorf, and 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 quite honestly, I don't the, have the ordinance in front. When of we do, when when there's an art show uh, like an opening in 1978, and they have wine there, they don't get a social permit. They don't need it because they're not charging. They're not social selling. permit is only when you're charging. So, correct. They're not selling. Right. So Sorry. social I affairs don't. permit. So uh, that's why they need to get a social affairs permit for the beer garden. But not everybody who has come to us has asked for a beer garden. And some of the people, I've had rent party come to me and ask if I would support them having beer at their September picnic. And I said, no, I wouldn't support that. So if Pride Fest comes before us next year and ask for a beer garden, we're going to say no. Or we're going to say okay to Maplewood Stock two months later. I didn't say that. Uh, that's been our practice. First of all, Pride Fest has never come and said that. They and will next year, trust me. Okay. That's why so, I'm bringing this up, so, among other reasons. So <laughs> if they can make the case that, they, that it should happen, then maybe we should allow it. I mean, the, the whole thing about the beer garden for Maplewood Stock was to raise revenue to bring in a higher quality band. That's how it was sold to us. So if Pride is saying, look, our costs are going up because it's become now this regional player, then maybe we should consider that and have it done the same way. But I'm not concerned about that. I'm concerned about the application where we had a local brewery, which is a for-profit company, partner with uh, a group to raise money and all it was was a, an event to drink, mm -hmm. yeah. eat and drink. Yeah, and we yeah. could say no to those people based on our parameters. Well, I, don't, say, I don't know how you say no to those folks. We said, no to no. No, we said no to those folks, I think. Right? Well, we have said no to those yeah. folks, but now, you, now if, we're, if you're saying that we're not changing the ordinance and we're going to take it case by case, 
on and, and only deal with things like the beer garden, I could accept that. But I'm just concerned about folks going there and saying, hey, you, you voted to allow alcohol in the parks. Okay, so I, I see the mayor's point and I can, I, can, I can go with that. If it's okay for organizations, nonprofits, who are, going, who are going to have a cordoned off beer garden where alcohol is being sold, therefore requiring them to have a social affairs permit from the state ABC and have to get our permission to do it because it's our parks. I'm okay with that. Yeah, I'm okay with that too. I just was not clear that that was what it was. It just seemed like a random yeah. decline. Right, and uh, I never said we should change our ordinance. No. Yeah. Okay, so I, I just want to be clear. So, the you know something that we can't decide is the requirement of the of of the social affair permit. That's something that comes from the state ABC, and a requirement for that is that the group be a nonprofit. Yeah. Okay. One of the requirements. So yeah. right, I mean, but among them, so you know, so so that's you know, so, so that, that's not even within our discretion. So in order to come to us to ask for the permission, there's already a limited number of of entities that could do that and you know on the specifics you know if you know I mean this is a this is a hypothetical but it may not be hypothetical for long if pride fest North Jersey pride came and said we are a nonprofit we have a we can get a social affairs permit or we have a social affairs permit from the state of New Jersey ABC and in order to do this regional North Jersey pride event and keep it here in Maplewood and raise necessary money uh, you know, we want to have a beer garden and maybe in addition, sort of like Maple Woodstock does, you know, there will also be community charity organizations that will benefit from the sale based on volunteers. You know, I, I mean, I would vote for that. You know, I mean, you know, I mean, I, in theory. So, you know, I have no problem with that. I think that I share the mayor's concern and it may not even be within our parameters to sort of open it up beyond that because I don't think the, so, the state ABC is going to give social affairs permits to a number of other organizations anyway. So I don't think we necessarily have to change the process or change our ordinance. We just have to apply it evenly for those who qualify and consider them on a case by case basis. Is it? Which is how I started. Yeah, that's, that's exactly. That's right. It's, that's what I was saying before. If someone mirrors Maple Woodstock, then they have a right to, uh, to just as anyone else. I think that's what you're saying. So if Pride mirrors Maple Woodstock's process and they should, and we vote, they get a license, they get a license. Yeah, if Period. you're a nonprofit and, you, and, and you're and you eligible and you receive a social affairs permit right. from New Jersey, and then, then yeah. mirror Maple Woodstock. So let's just be clear, because this is how it's written here, as associated with event applications. So event applications are a very broad term mm -hmm. where people who want to use public space fill out an event application. It's completely different than what we're talking about now in that in, in certain cases, there would be a separate uh, fundraising entity which would sell beer and wine, which would be regulated both by the state and our police department. Yep. That is fine. Then we treat everybody equally. Sure. And if, if somebody wants to have a, a, a beer garden, if, if Ren Party wants to have a beer garden at their thing, and they can they can come here and ask for that permission, right? And then they would have to to, to get the social affairs from it, and they have to have it all policed and fenced off and all that kind of stuff. Yep. That's a, the police department would have to do a review and make a Correct. determination as right. to the number right. of officers that were there, right. et cetera. So yeah, I think that's what the policy is. Yeah, I just don't. I just don't. I'm just concerned about who you say no to. But if we're going to have these very tight parameters, then it's one thing. But and um, we don't want if members of the township committee now or future want to say now there's too many events like you know it might be arbitrary but if everybody if three people agree that you know what many beer gardens we don't right. want to have them at every event that happens in the park and, and every year the majority of voters in this town get the opportunity to choose who sits in these seats and gets to make decisions like that so I mean I'm, I'm fine with that I mean I guess my question then um, for either Ms. Fritzen or Mr. Desiderio would be if, if an applicant makes an application for an event to the township and they are unhappy with you know the rejection or limitation that's placed on them do they have the ability other than to sort of come up during public comment 
is there a process for them to appeal that in some way? Whereas each of the ordinances has their own provision, but generally speaking, yeah, the courts. Source. The courts. Okay. Okay. No, I, I was I was just wondering whether because you know because in some cases they they appeal to. Wait, no, we have had. Well, we try to never have it be appealing to the governing body. Okay. I mean, there are some times with when an appeal is is to the administrator with regard to certain action, but I'd have to look at each ordinance individually. But at some point, some administrator should make a decision, not the executive, legislative executive function. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, so I think, you know, and just thinking about this, I think we should limit it to Memorial Park. I think all the other parks are neighborhood parks, and I would not do this in the neighborhood parks. Number two, I think that um, this should be um, ancillary to the activity that's going on. So the beer garden is not about Maple Woodstock. Maple Woodstock is about the, the music. Beer garden would not be... Um, Pride Fest. The Pride Fest is about Pride Fest. So it's an ancillary, it's an accessory use of the park to support the activity that is happening there. So I think we can craft some things. We, I would change the ordinance to allow those things to be considered. But I would not allow it at Dehart, Maplecrest, Borden, um, Orchard. I think those are, uh, I think we're running it, we're going to run into problems. I think Maplecrest is big enough to handle something like this. Um, you mean Memorial? Well, I'm sorry, Memorial, thank you. Uh, Memorial is big enough to handle. So I, I, My only hesitation with that, one of, one of our discussions sometimes is we don't want every event to be at Memorial This Park. side of town. And, yeah. and the, the event you, you exemplified, the REM Party Family Picnic, is in fact in Maplecrest Park, so they wouldn't those parameters they would not be able to and maybe they would then want to move it and do we want them to move it yeah and this is the problem at Maple Crest Park is you is they, they have that concert right next to the playground one of the reasons we did this here is you put it up up on the hill away from everything it's not near the playground here it's not near kids and then maybe we're just being too uh, you know when we voted on this all of our puritanical blood <laughs> came out I don't know but there are you know it was just I've been to many public parks and events where they have kid activities and rides and they have next door is the beer garden. So maybe it's, it's not that. But, you know, we have generally tried to separate the beer garden stuff from all the other activities that go on. So I would support Memorial and Maple Crest only. I, I take your point about the other parks being two local neighborhood parks. And, and then you get into other quality of life issues and... You know, I think Maple Cross is big enough to got that whole section behind the police station that don't that doesn't abut right, right next to the uh, skate, park. skate park. Right. Yeah. Well, in all <laughs> fairness, yeah. there were kids, I, I people with their Maple kids. Crest park, but you know what? There Somebody's going to have to draft something. And we're going right. to have to look at it. So there were people with we'll kids in yes the no. beer garden right. at Maple Woods Stock this weekend. Works. So then are we moving forward with some tight parameters? Well, I mean, I guess what I'd want to understand is what revisions is this going to require, if any, to an ordinance or a resolution that we've that's currently on the books that we're going to have to vote on? Well, I think what you do, you, you have, we have it on the books now, you can't have it in public spaces. And because you, you say that uh, organizations may apply to have a beer garden or a I don't know what the technical term is, but a beer wine garden in X park parks um, that they have to come to the township committee to ask for. It. That's what you do. Okay, well, so, so we would just be basically codifying the current policy. Right. Okay. I'm, I have no problem with that. Because I think Mr. Daffis is right. It's sort of an insider's game. If, if you, you know, the, the, Maple Woodstock people knew enough to come and ask, and other groups who use it don't. So if you have it in there, and then you change your event application form where it says no alcohol in the parks, it says if you're contemplating about having an event where there would be a beer garden, it can only be in X park, parks, and you must get a social affairs permit, and blah, 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 blah. 
reminded me, it was, it, it was I who told Maple Woodstock that they'd have to get the permission of the governing body to have alcohol in the park. <laughs> Started it because I had done the same in the town I worked in, in Red Banks. So, but, but that was before you were a member of this governing body. Of course. Right. Uh, but that, but my point is, I don't. I'm. I'm not sure we need to ordinance at all if policy to be there for anybody to use. There's no like. There's nothing in there that that states which parks or which everything that could be a discussion in the decision. To my not. To my Oh, it says no parks and no buildings. I'm not. I think it. When yeah. we looked at it, it didn't list any buildings, so we just need to take another look to make sure it lists the buildings that we allow. But um, it does. It mentions the library, and it's really I understand specific what you're about saying. the it library. It might have been Kids in a different section that we were looking at at the meeting, but uh, in, in the ordinance. Okay, so uh, talk about it again, a code. <laughs> yeah. So, Mr. Desdera, what are we doing? <laughs> Would you give me some proposed changes? I made some notes, and we'll circulate something to the governing body to take a look at. Okay. Everybody good with that? Yep. Sure. Okay. Maps so safe rides. Okay. Less controversial. Um, so we are moving forward with the technical app to support the dispatching of the rides, and now we're getting into some really interesting uh, technical conversations about intellectual property rights, who will have rights to this uh technology um and the person who the person or entity that has the rights will also be responsible for backroom support um uh, of such technology uh and 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 i had a couple meetings with our developer who was a maplewoodian resident um and you know he is part of a technology firm uh, that works with a venture capitalist firm, and they're obviously interested in having the intellectual property rights. And I wanted to bring this to the governing body um, and see how we feel about our relationship to that. Um, if we were to give up intellectual property rights to this technology, um, I would definitely urge you all uh, for us to at least get some royalties from the sale thereof, because I, I do believe that this is gonna be something that this developer is gonna to sell to other school districts across the country once our rollout happens and it proves to be very successful. So, opening it up. Why would we not? Yeah. Right. Who owns it? Uh, no one owns it right now. <laughs> <laughs> that's my that's my question, right? We're no funded. no one owns it. Funding. We funded a portion of it, but I fund a lot of things. That doesn't mean I own them. <laughs> right. Okay. But they, South Orange funded it too, I so, think. No. Well, no, I did think, not fund it. I think. <laughs> well, I can give you an update as to that too. But <laughs> so. So I don't know. Right. right. I I I think that we need to. How are we going to navigate? the intellectual property stuff. I don't know. We could talk offline about it. Sure, absolutely. But I mean, yeah. I think the sense of the governing body is, yeah, if there's, if, if there's money that can be made into it, I, you know, that's fine. But Right, because uh, then we wouldn't be responsible to support this thing on a monthly basis because there's going to be technical support, there's going to be uh, data tracking on the back end to make the technology better and to let us know how successful we are. Uh, so while we're administering the initiative in terms of our PD registering drivers, we would not be uh, charged with the expensive and administrative nightmare of monthly support. Data warehouse for this. Come again? Data warehouse, right? So there's data including miners' information and Cards, or it's going to like no, no, no. This is all free, so there'll be no credit cards, but there will be student IDs, yeah, and so all of that stuff would be confidential, uh, closed circuited system. 
Right, unless it's breached. But you know, that's like with everything. It really does get complicated. It's very complicated, right? So, so is the program successful now? Come again? Is the program successful now? It hasn't it hasn't started. Yet. It hasn't started. We're hoping for rollout in September. We have a beta version right. of the app that we're playing so, with now. So we don't know if anyone's going to sell it to anyone else because we don't know how successful it is. We believe that it will be successful. Okay. Um, so we have to protect ourselves at the front end just to right. make sure in case it goes off the charts, we're covered. Right. So we'll talk offline. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, I'm just I'm thinking aloud. Is there a threshold <laughs> issue for a municipality to do this? To be in a profit making business? All right. Yes. Okay. We'll think about it. We'll fly. Okay. All right. That's all I had, Mayor. Okay, Mr. Desiderio. On I, have, uh, I promise to be real quick. Uh, Honey Maplewood wants to put a walk-in freezer in the uh, in the back of their uh, proposed store on Maplewood Avenue. Uh, there is a theory that the township owns the property behind the uh, behind theory. it, um, and. Uh, that being said, uh, they need to go to the planning board for a minor site plan review. Um, they have the application because the issue of ownership of the property, uh, they're asking the township to, uh, to sign the application. Uh, it has also been signed by Mr. Bob Rowe, um, who is the uh, landlord of the property, allowing him. Uh, I did request the engineer go out and take a look at it. Uh, he did so. He had, uh, I don't know, eight, nine, 10, 12 bullet points which really I think are more appropriate to go to the planning board when, yeah. the, uh, when, they, uh, when they do the site review, the minor site review. So uh, I am simply asking you whether or not you will authorize Ms. Baveros to sign the application and have it move forward. So j just a little background. We got a call from Ani Rahman um, about meeting the principals, the owners there. So Annette, uh, Annette De Palma and I went and they were exploring where to put their cooler. Uh, one option was to put it up on the hill where there's a parking lot to use one of the two parking lot parking spots that they had allocated them to put it there. Uh, or they part of this property. Yeah. And then the other was um, they were going to have to dig out the basement to put it there. That would have been costly. And uh, yeah. um, and then the third, we came up with this idea of putting it in the back because at the time we thought this was all part of the property. We thought our property ended at the top of the hill, not at the bottom of the hill. So that's why. And you don't I know if it is or I not. I can't represent to you where your property ends. Okay. <laughs> so I think um, I think this is a much better property. It's a better location, rather. It's right, you know, outside the door. There's no liability of people going up and down that hill. Um, and so I would be in favor of yeah. moving and, forward. And apparently, from what the engineer says, their method of egress is not going to be affected no. in the back, so that they'll have that method of egress. Right. His comments we regard with regard to that 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 wall and with regard to the slope. Right. Uh, so they'll have to deal with those at the uh, at right. the planning board. But there's a bigger issue is if if that is actually our property, then we have to take a look at that because we got our the steep slope. You got retaining walls there. You got this old rickety staircase there that should come out completely I, if it's ours? I was there. I, yeah, I, so I you walked, saw I it. Yep. We have, is a survey being done that we can ascertain where our property is? No. no. That's not what the issue is. The issue is that Mr. Bobro conveyed something to the township many years ago. But effectively, what it looks to me is they never did a subdivision, OK? So he has conveyed, or what he intended to convey, to the township. But there should have been there should have been a proper subdivision before that was done. It was not done. So as I sit here, I can't tell you what you want, and the survey is not going to be of any assistance whatsoever. So to the mayor's uh, chaining walls and steps and everything, who's How do we know whose responsibility? Well, I think is? the solution to that may be that Ami Rahman may be, if they want this approval based on the engineer's I, well, recommendation. Well, I was going to suggest that, but I. It's in, it's in the engineer's recommendations. 
Oh, okay. So yeah. that may be the solution. Uh, so I would move the approval of uh, allowing Ms. Viveros to sign the application. Second. In favor as Please well. call the roll. Yeah. Adams? Yes. Davis? Yes. Delembrick? Yes. Mr. McGee? Yes. Mayor DeLuca? Yes, thank you. We get a motion on the consent agenda. Mr. Mayor, I move adoption of items one through nine of the consent agenda. Second. Any discussion? Please call the roll. Ms. Adams? Yes. Mr. Davis? Yes. Mr. Lembrick? Yes. Mr. McGeehee? Yes. Mayor DeLuca? Yes. Our second public comment, is there anyone who wants to address the Township Committee? <clears throat> I'm sorry. Hello, my name is Tracy Woods, uh, again at 253 Burnett Avenue, and I just wanted to um, I've followed up with a question about the end of the discussion about the South Mountain um, complex. Uh, at the end of that discussion, Ms. Adams um, asked if she should make a motion. And then you said something, Mayor, and I just didn't hear you. Um, what did you say about what the process would be for that? Uh, Mr. Desiderio is going to draft the resolution. It's going to be on the August 6th, 6th. meeting agenda. Okay. Um, you know, again, just because we don't have any um, communication, you know, a clear chain of communication, we don't really know what the slate of events for approvals for, you know, it all comes out very quickly before it happens. But we do know that the county um, put a deadline of August 7th on a counter petition to the one that has um, nearly 8,000 signatures from West Orange. So the fact that they put that August 7th deadline, I guess I'm just saying because we have such short lead times on um, when actions are going to be taken, I would encourage the committee not to wait um, just because there may not be time to pass one if some legislative thing comes to go forward. Or to get it to them in time. Yeah, or to, or to so, you know, make the kind of noise with it that you would want to make. So if, we, it, if we pass it on the 6th, it will get there on the 7th. Right, but we wouldn't have time to um, walk it around. <laughs> uh, you know, just, just I'm just pointing out, I, although, um, again, I don't want to step outside of uh, what the process is. Uh, just another um, thing that I wanted to make a point of is Again, I, I drafted some language for the Township Committee to consider, and um, one of the uh, concerns that the Township Committee members raised is about the expression um, asking, calling them on, on the uh, county to stop expansion in the South Mountain Reservation. And I just want to read the last line of what I drafted and see, because uh, it's slightly different from that, and I'm going to see how you feel about um, that phrase. The inclusion of ice. Yeah, it says, uh, now therefore be it resolved, I had to look up how you phrase that, uh, by the Township Committee of Maplewood that the Township of Maplewood calls on Essex County Board of Freeholders to, fault further exp or to halt further expansion of the South Mountain Recreation Complex into the South Mountain Reservation. So it's not saying that there won't be any other parks or any other, you know, development of any kind. It specifically calls out that complex. I'd also be okay with the specific term Tootleback Zoo. Um, you know, if we just want to call specifically for the zoo not to be expanded, I would also be okay with that. You know, just as uh, my personal thoughts about the topic. Um, so again, I encourage the township committee not to, or to act as soon as is um, reasonable. Well, that's, Mr. Desiderio, we, we've done this before with other resolutions. If we were to, agree on bullet points of the resolution that you then draft up and vote on it tonight. And we do that something. The like answer that. is, yeah, we memorialize resolutions mm -hmm. all the time. Right. The only issue I see with this one is, I think there's going to be some input that people are going to. I don't think we have agreement. To I don't, yeah, I think you're going to. And say, yes, we'll be here all night making sauce. Yeah. It, without having something on paper, it's going to be very difficult to do. So, I mean, but you memorialize all the time. Right. Well, I can read this, what the first part of the draft and then add the other bullets. And if it starts taking as long as sausage takes, then we can postpone it and do it the way we agreed. 
add this to review at, yeah, as well, we came into our discussion. Right. Well, this they, part oh, that Tracy sent to, I believe, Frank and or Mr. McGee and me. Um, no, no, I'm saying she just sent it to the two of us as the green team people and environmental and because I was there. But it was um, it still has several bullets based on comments of the public and based on the conversation that we had that would be added to it anyway. So if you'll indulge me for two minutes and then we can decide what we're going to do. Is that okay. fair? Uh, whereas the South Mountain Reservation is an important community resource treasured by the residents of Maplewood and Essex County, as well as visitors to our area, whereas covering additional acreage of the South Mountain Reservation with impervious surfaces will contribute to stormwater issues, including flooding and water pollution, whereas the forest of the South Mountain Reservation sequesters carbon from the atmosphere, playing an important role in the sustainable future of Essex County, whereas South Mountain Reservation provides habitat for wildlife, whereas the South Mountain Reservation is the only access many residents have to natural space, whereas the Township <coughs> Committee of Maplewood advocates for the county's transition from reliance on contracts with Immigration and Customs Enforcement, this is where I, I was hesitant to include this, and the expenditure of large sums of county capital on non-essential projects will hinder this transition. And then the now therefore that Trace, Ms. Woods just um, read, I would add um, to, uh, I would add whereas more money is needed for reforestation of the South Mountain Reservation, as one bullet, whereas um, an outside nature learning center could be implemented without um, paving and building a structure uh, or something to that effect, whereas no money for plans make um, no money, as Mr. Lumbrick's point, money for plans, um, an extensive amount of money for plans may uh, commit the county or the freeholders to um, moving ahead with the project in the future, regardless of public input, whereas transparency of the process and lack of stakeholder input, um, blah, 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 that, that would be the other one, and whereas there has not been seen an overall master plan for the zoo, um, even though the, it's been requested, and pro projects like this have not been properly vetted with the public, now, therefore, we have to dissolve to dissolve. I would not vote for this. I want to see it. So I'm just me. That's just me. I don't. First of all, I, you're making an assumption. Outdoor learning center is better than indoor learning center. I don't really know that. What I do know is I'm convinced that there's no plan there that there should be no work done until there's a plan that is more transparent, that the community is involved. I think just saying reforestation, I don't know what that means. Is What, what is the plan? So, uh, you know, um, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't combine the ICE stuff with this. No, I, that's what I said. Okay, I, am I still allowed to talk? I'm sorry, I, I didn't want to go off uh, the, the rules. Um, my personal opinion is that's all fine. Strike the ice bit. Um, you know, we can make it about the um, the lack of a uh, the master plan and call for the halt of the expansion until that time. I mean, that's the most urgent. I, I also agree with the mayor about um, the outdoor learning center and all of that. That feels like that needs more um, research. Uh, that we should just if we can address the most urgent needs and that is the halting of any um further funds or um being expended yeah being expended or you know planning for um annexation of the until the master plan you know, until the proper process has happened well as i understand that didn't the freeholders appropriate six hundred thousand dollars they haven't approved any contracts yet or anything right no, they have not. So it's not a further funding. It's that we don't want the 600000 to be spent or any additional money. Well, be, and again, I, uh, because they already voted on that, isn't the horse kind of out of the barn on that? I don't know what the... No. 
Okay. They still, it's just, it's just they're allocating that money. They still have to get contracts, and right. so yeah, we're asking them not to spend that six hundred thousand mm -hmm. or any additional money, and that there should be a plan. It should be presented. It should be a plan for the whole reservation, and the Turtleback expansion should be part of that larger plan. Yeah. If it's we so want, if we want this resolution to be effective, I really think we need to take the time to draft it. Fine with that, as long as it is. I mean, Ms. Woods, can you talk again? I had a problem hearing you um, oh, sorry. when you said something about August 7th. What is that about? So again, this is a little bit just sort of connecting the dots because not very much public information has been shared about what the process is going to be. Um, but we know that the deadline on the petition, the change.org petition that's been issued by the county is August 7th and that there is a freeholder meeting that night. Right. So, so if, if we were to pass something on August 6th, we could send it to them the next morning and absolutely. still meet the deadline. Mm -hmm. And one of us can actually show up that night with it <laughs> and say, we adopted this last night and we, you know, or, you know you. or certainly a member of our community or our green team could come and read right. the resolution. Yeah, it's a public resolution. resolution. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I think, you know, it's, I think, uh, yeah. you know, we, you know, it's not like we have to put this you know, in the in the mail and put a stamp on it. I mean, we're gonna hmm. we're gonna send this to them. Right. You know, I mean, you know, we, I mean, Ms. Fritz, I mean, you know, we can get this to them the next morning, right? Absolutely. Yeah. So I I, I, I don't. I mean, I I sort of I, I agree with the mayor that I, I'd like to actually see this and take a look at it. And okay. uh, you know, it is it is an important issue, and and I think I want to make sure that what we're conveying to them is is what we really want to convey, and not just done done tonight okay. because we want to get out of here no, we, we also want to get out of here don't we know possible. the clerk of the freeholder board <laughs> she provided the master plan very quickly okay, okay. Well, that's still public session anything else well i uh, know that's it thank you i'm sorry i right. wasn't sure thank if you walk away no that's okay thank you thank you tracy I just, my name is Carrie Gordon from 34 Gerard Place. And I just to add on to what Tracy said, I would just make sure the language is really tight because they're going to come back and say, well, we did have a public forum in, last year in February and we got feedback. Um, the they won't say that Wednesday, all the feedback was negative and that they didn't act on any of the feedback, but just really make sure the language is tight so that they can't maneuver out of it. Yeah, we could use the word adequate public. I believe if I and to listen to I the think public was feedback. Like 11 a.m. on a Wednesday. Yeah, and to I listen to the public feedback. I don't. I mean, there's a like Tracy said. There's a petition that has over 8,000 signatures of people opposing this, and um, the county is sending out of a, their own petition in support of it, which has 300 signatures now. But um, yeah, it's it's not. Um, they're obviously trying to steamroll it through. And so that's just, yeah, with the language that you work on, make sure they, they can't okay. maneuver out. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Anyone else? Um, we'll close the public comment period. Next up, we have reports from departments. I don't know if we got the chief financial report. We didn't get, we didn't get that chief financial report. No, there was a, just that memo. Yeah. The tax Let's make sure that we don't put stuff on unless the reports, because this is a couple times now with this. I'll check you did it get out. tomorrow. Okay. You did get the monthly report. Yeah, the right? monthly report, right. but this says a budget report, which is something different that he provides to us. Hmm. Okay. okay, administrative reports. Ms. Riveros. Okay, Mayor, a couple of things. Um, we currently, this is regarding the fire department, we currently sent out um, five recruits to the academy. Unfortunately, one um, did not make it in the academy, and therefore we have a vacancy there. Uh, we're asking to send the fifth trainee to the academy that should start mid-August. Uh, um, we also will have a vacancy later this year, uh, and that would cause a sixth vacancy. So the fire chief and I are requesting that we consider sending two people to the academy. That would include the fifth person and the sixth person that we anticipate having a vacancy later in the year. So, so Ms. Vera, just to clarify, so that would be the four that we currently have in the academy and the top two on the present list. Correct. Okay. We'd go I, down the list. Right. I, 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 I'd like to make a motion that we add 
uh, the next two on the list to uh, to the academy. Second. Call the roll. Ms. Adams. Yes. Mr. Daffis. Yes. Mr. Lembrick. Yes. Mr. McGeehy. Yes. Mayor DeLuca. Yes, thank you. Anything else? Yes. Um, I sent out a memo from our uh, CFO regarding tax bills. Uh, typically, uh, in past practice, what we've done is sent out estimate bills. However, um, in light of uh, dealing with our budgetary constraints and being a little more prudent about our spending, our CFO is looking at what we could do is hold off on sending estimated tax bills. I think you're looking at perhaps a month's time. We'll let the public know about when we're sending the tax bills. So there's a savings in terms of postage and and resending things. And I believe we're also doing a mailing extra with that about the recycling magnets. Well, that's what I, if that goes in the regular tax bill, it's fine. But if it's going to cost that much extra I don't, and you're trying to be prudent, maybe that just is something that's distributed as I said in my email earlier okay. today, Department of Public Works and every department here. Okay, office. we could talk about it tomorrow in engineering and how we do it. Uh, so once we get the tax rates from the county, then that's when we're ready to go. So we'll have a better idea to inform the residents, obviously, about the date, the grace period, and so forth. So there still is that 10-day grace period once they're due. We're looking towards the end of August. Just to be clear, taxes are not due on August 1st. They are not due on August 1st. Very, very clear about that because yes. people race down here, as you know. We've gotten calls, so we just want to make sure that and let you all know that taxes are not due August 1st. Anything else? I'm um, just the uh, um, cooling centers. We had the, the email. I have, yeah, I have. Go ahead. Are you, oh, I thought. Have further to say, right? Yes. Okay. I'm sorry. I That's thought, okay. I thought he meant anything else regarding this. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, we have a vacancy in the Community of Development uh, Department. This is for a part time uh, office assistant who has uh, been doing uh, some clerical. Um, duties and now with spatial data logic there's a lot more technical and administrative work that goes into it so we're just looking to fill that position um we sent out an increase in hours or anything right there is no increase in hour it is the same um our community development director looked at the position and made some adjustments to what we're currently doing and, and that's with the spatial data logic and how we're uh doing some some of the communications there so so you're asking for approval to for the, fill that position, fill that position that current position? It, correct. I'd move it. Roll the roll. Ms. Adams? Yes. Mr. Daffis? Yes. Mr. Lemberg? Yes. Mr. McGeehy? Yes. Mayor DeLuca? Yes. And I have one more. Uh, there is a there will be a vacancy at the end of this month in the public works department. That is the office assistant position, and that position office, um, offers administrative clerical uh, support to to the staff there, including payroll, attendance, record keeping. Um, so, uh, I'm answering the phone, maybe answering the phone. Nice. <laughs> taking work orders. Um, this person is part of the, also the SDL process, and we've brought that over to Public Works, so. Um, this is a full-time position, right? It is a full-time position, yes. Any cool? Good move by Ms. Adams. Is there a second? I'll second. Who's called the roll? Ms. Adams? Yes. Mr. Daffis? Yes. Mr. Lembrick? Yes. Mr. McGeehy? Yes. Mayor DeLuca? Yes, thank you. That's Anything all I else? Have. You have a question? Oh, yeah. Cooling stations. Um, the cooling centers that uh, the email went out today at the end of the day. Uh, can we make sure that gets out on social media since the next couple of days are supposed to be extremely. Yes, it should have gone out in all avenues, but we'll do it every day just to reiterate it. Yeah, as the but I mean, like it's not on Facebook. Okay. Uh, so I'm talking about it needs to go yeah. wherever. Yeah. This weekend is expected to be okay. very hot. And this, yeah, the week. I have a couple questions, Mary, if I may. Yeah, I'm sorry, just going back to on the cooling centers, we generally do not open the community center at DHART unless we have requests on a weekend. 
We do have the library that's open. On the weekend. On the weekend. So. Okay. Um, Unless well, there's an event already going on and we have a building attendant. At the, at wood, the heart. Yeah. So that, that the would, heart. I mean, I'm sorry, at the heart. Yeah. So I, I think you just have to look at all those schedules and <laughs> right. find out hours and stuff. But generally. We'll that with the community services director. I think the message should be that if you have a heat emergency in your house, call the police. Yes, absolutely. And if the police get a call, then they'll call somebody to come in and open up the center. But we generally don't staff it unless it's some it's staff for another event. We'll, we'll figure out the coordination. If there's already there, then we'll add that to the, to the alert. Mm -hmm. So what is the communication going to say or says for the weekend? For the weekend, it'll say that obviously call the police if there is a if there is any heat issues. Uh, we'll put out the PCNG also uh, information on there. And um, I have to figure out if the would I mean if the if the heart is open. If it is, then we can add that in there. So the I, senior I center for seniors library. No, that we just not, not just, seniors, the, just to heart. According it's to our heart. OEM, it's the heart right. because it has a generator. Got it. So if something goes out, okay, they have a backup. Okay, okay. okay cool. Okay. Got it. Um, okay. and, and these um, our assistant administrator said our uh, public health nurse, assistant health officer, is working on a PSA on um, weather conditions and cooling and how to operate that for health advisory purposes. So we'll add that in there. Great. I have a couple questions, if I may. Uh, so um, what is the update on the volunteer handbook? How's that coming along? I haven't uh, gotten a chance to get back to that, but we'll do that. OK. Um, Regarding the, uh, there was a new law that the governor signed, um, gosh, I'm forgetting the name of it right now, which is terrible. Uh, it has to do with um, PSCNG is not allowed to cut off service when there is a medical hardship in, in, the, in the household. Um, and I'm wondering if we can get that information out to the community so that they know that. Okay. And if do you have that anything that came from PSAG? But do you know if the if the law requires people to let PSENG know or any of that? I, I know the law you're referring to. Yeah, yeah. it was uh, it was the woman who was right. who had their who died, who, yeah. who right. died in Newark. Right. right. Um, it was signed in the last. If you do a Google like search, a right. It was last month. It's utility shutoffs. Should be able to find. So right. typically, we get those alerts if if there's a utility shut off <coughs> as part of the process. PSENG forwards those to us. Any like residential? Any shut off? Yeah. Yeah. But we don't necessarily know if there's somebody with a medical. No, I wouldn't know. I just know that that's. Uh, I mm -hmm. guess that's what I'm asking. Well, we so see if out. the law requires somebody who's on oxygen tank or something. Okay. We'll take right. a look at and that. see what the notification sure, is. Yeah, you know. make sure residents know that they need to. We have a PSC and liaison, right? Yes. yes. You should just contact the liaison and get the information. Okay. It'll, it'll it's been a little hard. And find out what their process is, et cetera. So. Now, we also have a list that the fire department maintains of people who are on um, okay. medical equipment. Okay. And so if there's a power failure, they'll either try to make sure that they have some way of getting care for it, or they'll bring a generator to that house. So that's the low-hanging fruit right there. So we have this list. Let's see what the, our contact says. Then maybe we set up a, a communication and I'll email to that list to let them know what they should do with PSNG in the event. Right. And I think we need to coordinate whatever we find out and whatever we send out with our local assistance board because uh, Ms. Ashman will probably receive calls about this at some point, may receive calls about it. Um, did you want to provide an update about the Wi-Fi project? We basically met again and we're moving forward. I can, uh, I, whatever you want. That was, that was one of my questions I'd like yeah. to hear. Yeah. So I, I'm actually going to turn over to the assistant administrator who met with actually the project manager that uh, dealt with um, the two vendors over in Newark and how the infrastructure worked out. Um, it, there's a lot of technical things that are going into the connection and how it all actually worked. 
So. Uh, Glenn Michalowski, Assistant Township Administrator. Uh, yeah, Monday morning, the mayor uh, and I and Seth Wainer, who is a resident of South Orange and was the CIO in Newark, sat down and talked about, uh, well, it's, uh, there's a lot more to it, and there's some conversations we need to have with some partners in the community um, at Elite, uh, with NJT, uh, New Jersey Transit, and the, the school business administrator about tying into the fiber network and how we're going to provide internet access to the Wi-Fi access points. Um, and then we have another conversation ongoing with uh, OSI and Ruckus, who was on state contract to provide the actual hardware for the Wi-Fi pilot and uh, we're, like, we, we need to reach out, we need to have these conversations and check into the, the feasibility. I just got the base map for um, the township that the engineering department provided and I'm gonna forward that over to OSI and Ruckus tomorrow. We're gonna use that to identify Wi-Fi access points that we can look at and see where the need is and how many we can actually install. But, uh, but again, there's kind of two conversations happening. One is about the hardware, the other is gonna be about tying the hardware to the fiber network. And uh, we're gonna to need to reach out to some community partners for that one. So the hardware, uh, just ballpark, yes, I mean, what are we talking about in terms of quantity? I think when we had the conversation on Monday, each access point was between three and 4,000, but we haven't gotten any numbers from the vendor yet. This is just from Seth's experience in Newark installing this, this hardware. Right. And we don't know how many. Yeah, we're not that far yet right. in the discussion. We don't, we don't know how many access points we're going to need. Uh, and we're sort of trying to figure out what the capacity issues are with each access point. We think that on average, 200 people per access point. And we're looking at a radius around Seth Boyden Elementary School, that neighborhood there, that could be as many as, is it 1,300 households? Mm -hmm. Being pragmatic, it looks like that will have to be scaled back a little bit just based on the amount that we have we have available to us. And the, that's the universe that we've, we've that's picked the universe. up, about 1,300. Right, correct. We have, to, we have to zero it down. A lot of it's going to depend on the high buildings or high points we have to put these towers. towers. We had uh, Ms. Viveros has contacted Tom people, Powers. Tom Powers at uh, Elite uh, Property. Probably and um mark corelli who i was with yesterday so i talked to him about it because okay. he was on vacation when you called him so he wanted to know how much we were paying him i told him nothing he was <laughs> <laughs> um so anyway we're looking at these access points and uh these because they're high enough to send the signal down when we met with seth on monday he was talking about that there may be something we need to put either on the roof of the individual house or what they did at uh, Georgia King Village is they had something that someone plugged in into their home. Mm -hmm. um, so, and it all comes down to a question of how much, how fast we want to provide. Right, so traditionally these access points are used to provide Wi-Fi in public outdoor spaces. So the, the fact that we're trying to get these into the homes, uh, there's gonna be limitations with speed just based on how these access points work. So like again, there are devices available that will amplify the signal Mm -hmm. And depending on if we go that route, you can give it to the resident, that will amplify the outdoor signal or how we can strategically place these points so that they will make it into the home at a speed that is significant enough to, you know, to be beneficial, you know, not like a dial up modem. It's so that gets so slowed down because there are physical barriers in the way of the signal. Is right. this um, 5G technology we're looking at? Mm -mm. No, oh, no. no. Okay. Moon. That's the moon. We are uh, also shooting for the fourth quarter of this year to get it up and right. And once we get into content, we'll have to coordinate with the school board uh, to make sure that we're consistent with what they with their content restrictions. So there's a lot more to figure out. Glenn, if you wouldn't mind sending me like a quick update from. Monday's meeting since I yeah I have I, my I notes here I'll debrief everybody on yeah that. that'd be great okay anything else for Ms. Viveros I just have one more question um, Viveros a question you mentioned in your report about maintenance of the transit parking lot going to get more what do you mean by what do you mean by this work on this maintenance of the <coughs> are we referring to the one over on Baker 
Okay. Um, it, it is really in disarray. It, it, we've got a lot of potholes. We One of the issues that when we went to the parking vendor was to get away from the numbering because we couldn't even go there and stamp it properly with the numbers you couldn't make them out. It, it, it needs it needs uh, it needs maintenance um, at this point. So that's what I was referring to. So I've been talking to New Jersey Transit about getting that lot on on their what they refer to as their capital project list or capital project committee list. They come around a lot, right? When we have. A... I'm sorry, I can't hear you. We have a developer did a phenomenal job over there. If you've gone over there right by the end of yes, the lot, exactly. phenomenal job, right? And then we've done some paper work over there. So I think really that's one of the last steps, right? So right to um, enhance it at least. Right. Um, so yeah. I, it, it's been a long time coming and part of our contract and the fees that they collect, they're supposed to maintain the lot. So I'm trying to put a little more on them that with everything else we're doing downtown, that I think it's, it's appropriate that they, they do their part. So. Absolutely. Are we have to raise the prices of the parking? You know, one other thing is we are going to raise the price to what, what, September 1st to five bucks. We're trying to figure out the date um, because we want to make sure that we communicate that to the commuters. So um, that's something that that's ongoing. So we're look we were looking to do it then, but I just want to make sure that we get the right communication material out to the to their commuters also. So we're coordinating the date. One opportunity here is to go back to, you're talking to Michael, right? Michael, yes. uh, is to go back to them and say, look, we can throw this lot into our road program and then you reimbursement reimburse us for the cost. Because you're absolutely right. We're doing all this other work around and that place looks not very attractive. And it's not that big a job. We can add it. I mean, it might be Mr. Kittner can fit it into, uh, you know, in, into the, we extras want to add that for tomorrow's agenda yeah right. and then and then just bill them or we keep that whatever that margin is i know we send them six thousand a month but right um instead of sending them that extra two dollars you know whatever portion of the i guess we're not going to send them we, we keep the two dollars right it's three three dollars yeah so we keep so maybe you know so that that would be the way to do this get it done quickly i think that's a good Good conversation, yeah. right? Because we are mayor. Uh, we've discussed in engineering and planning that we've identified that that sidewalk strip beyond Lennox, uh, going up to right before the private property of the dance studio, is township property. So we are going to be upgrading that as well. So we might as well do it all together. Yeah, absolutely, do that, and that makes a lot of sense. I had a couple other things, Ms. Rivera's, if you don't mind. Uh, if you had any update on the uh, process of um, making our forms gender neutral? Yeah, I, um, at the last department head meeting, I made it clear to all department heads that whatever forms they, they have to exhaust them and then to include that language if it, if it is already, if it's not in there already. Okay, so. Right. Uh, so we'll just be asking for pronouns or not asking Absolutely. for gender. Yes. Okay, okay mm -hmm. great. And last but not least, speaking of heat advisories and cooling off, you may not be aware of this, but have you heard of any plan from the rec department, our community services director, with respect to opening up the pool to non-members one other time this pool season? I have not heard that. Okay. Maybe we can check in on that, if you don't mind. Is it in relation to the heat advisory? No, I'm just saying it? in oh, terms okay. of, it was very successful, the previous Once. event. Okay. And uh, we were talking about fitting it in one more time if the schedule allows. So I was w looking for an update on that. Okay. That's all I have. Okay, Mr. Desiderio. Thank you, Ms. Ms. Fritzen. Yes, uh, I, I sent the township committee uh, an update on the um, upcoming filming because it's a large one, I wanted you to be aware of what was going on in case you got any questions. Basically, it encompasses eight days, one actual day of filming, but seven days uh, nonetheless on top of that. Um, I think it's going to go smoothly. And um, if you have any questions, let me know at any time. Ms. Fritchin, just a, a question, and, and I realize this may not be your area of expertise, but do, do you know why they need a week? of days 
before they film one day? Is there just a lot of Actually, I do know setup? the answer to that. <laughs> well, I, then I'm, I'm glad I came to the right place. <laughs> well, uh, if you know the home, um, you know, it's a, a famous home, and it has dated, I would call it dated, it has 50s furniture in it. It's all coming out. All the furniture had to be emptied. So that's one reason. And um, again, it's a total interior filming. There's nothing going on outside. But basically, it's taking everything out of the house and refilling it with what their furniture, supplies, kitchen, everything is. I asked the same question. Okay. But they had to pay uh, for every day that they're filming. Right, right. So, you know, so I mean, I, I, so I, I take no issue with that. I realize that, you know, they must need the time if they're willing to pay for it. Right. Uh, you know, because even these Hollywood projects have budgets. But uh, it's, it's a great show. I think it's great that it's filming here. Mm -hmm. uh, next week, we're going to have an, uh, uh, an event planning meeting for two uh, large events coming up. One is a uh, 500 plus or minus uh, participation um concert in the park, which I need to hear more about. And the other is uh, Oyster Fest. And uh, I just want to remind uh, the Township Committee that the next meeting begins one hour later. Everything is pushed back one hour for uh, closed at 8 and the public meeting at 8.30 due to uh, the National Night Out. Any questions? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Elected official report, Mr. McGeehy. No report today, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Lindbrook. Yes, Mayor, I do have a few items. Uh, I want to talk about two of our recent major events and uh, give uh, give thanks and congratulations to a lot of the organizers. Uh, first, our July four event. Uh, although it was it was very uh, hot that day. I did like the way that uh, the crowd management worked uh, and movement and, and the way that the event flowed. Uh, I think we solved a lot of the problems that we had encountered in the past years in terms of the increasing amount of fencing and being able to, to, uh, to minimize the fencing. Uh, the fireworks were great this year, uh, and I think it was, it was a more community-centered event, but in some ways it was it got less community support and in one way was volunteers. I think that uh, one thing that, uh, you know, in speaking with both attendees and also with, uh, with the police chief about the event is that, uh, you know, it does seem as though it needs, it didn't have as much staff this year as in prior years. And I think it was just a difficulty in recruiting volunteers. So maybe that's something that we can work with the Civic Association and the 4th of July committee on to try to increase the number uh, of volunteers uh, for next year uh, and also proud to report uh, from the police chief and deputy chief that there were uh, no arrests uh, during the day or at night in connection with uh, the Independence Day festivities. Uh, Maple Woodstock just this past weekend, uh, also terrific from start to finish. Uh, both residents uh, and the police reported that the process in the morning in terms of people setting up tents and canopies uh, went really smoothly this year. Uh, the event was obviously very well attended. We had uh, great weather. Uh, the music was great. The vendors were great. Uh, and uh, again, proud to report that there were no arrests. Uh, and while there were some people treated uh, for scrapes, bumps, and bruises, my understanding is there was only uh, one person needed to be hospitalized, and that was due to dehydration or improper hydration, as the case might have been. Um, so I want to thank both the organizers of July 4 and Maple Woodstock for putting on these uh, great events. These are volunteer organizations, uh, and they devote uh, untold countless number of hours over the course of the year uh, to putting these events together, and uh, and they really contribute to uh, to this vibrant community and, and bring people together. So I want to want to thank them. Uh, the last thing I just wanted to um, say that you know the the community, uh, while we had a great weekend, you know, did lose uh, a, a member, uh, Eric Fink, 
uh, passed away on Saturday, tragically. Uh, and it, it's something that, uh, that really hit home for, for me because uh, he's, a, uh, he's in his 40s, was in his 40s, uh, young children, uh, and tragically passed away uh, this weekend so suddenly. Uh, so just wanted to uh, send my best and the township's best to, uh, to his family and friends here in Maplewood and beyond. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Ms. Adams. Yes, Mayor, just one thing. I just wanted to, uh, Mr. McGee and I are liaisons for the Maple Woodstock Committee, so um, it was a pleasure working with them this year and, and congratulating them on a very successful weekend. Um, uh, July 4th, if I can put my two cents in there, um, I got had a couple residents complain about the DJ or at least the choice of music since there are so many children in the um, audience, it'd be nice if, if expressing some vulgarities loudly and on a regular basis before the fire works. So that would be my two cents there. Uh, the cooling centers, I already asked Ms. Riveris about. Um, and when do we get the new chairs for the township committee? <laughs> <laughs> They're on order, right? Chairs that go up and down. The chairs that you're sitting in? Yes. Well, I didn't report, but actually uh, we're working on that now, but the shades are on order. Oh, good. Those $30,000. So you're going to have shades first, chair second. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's all, Mayor. Uh, Mr. Daffis. Just one item, Mayor. You'll be pleased to hear. Just one item. I just wanted to report on the update uh, as it relates to the paver construction in the village. Uh, I promised last time that I would give an update. Uh, we met with the contractor, and work is to resume tomorrow. And it looks like, based on the scheduling, that we're going to be going uh, through the end of August into mid to end September. The plan is to, the drop dead uh, plan is to uh, finish this thing before the beginning of the fourth quarter so we don't have any issues like we did last time. Uh, and we will uh, keep everyone abreast of any updates about that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I have three items. Uh, first, <clears throat> we got a report today from uh, our energy aggregation group. Uh, the final opt-out rescission, rescission uh, stats came in, and we had 30 of the five, in the five towns, we had over 30,000 um, customers enrolled into our alliance. Uh, which was 86% of all the customers in the five towns. So, um, and then 11% opted out and 3% were permanently rejected and that has to do with bad credit and enrollment and all that kind of stuff. In Maplewood, we had 6,830 6, 6, PSE&G uh, customers um, enroll in, uh, which was 87% and only 10% opt out. In South Orange, they had only 84% enroll and 14% opted out. So wait, it was an automatic enrollment. Unless you opted out. Unless you opted out. So out of the 6,860 some PSCNG customers, the ones who are eligible in Maplewood, uh, 600 some opted no, no, no. out? No, 6,000. 6, 6,830. Of the roughly 7,800 PSE&G customers in Maplewood, 6,830 enrolled. Oh. Was it 100%? That was 87%. 87%. Oh, okay, okay, yeah. okay. Enrolled, 87% enrolled. Uh, Glen Ridge had the highest, 89% enrolled. Maplewood and Montclair had 87% enrolled. South Orange, 84%, and Verona, 83%. So, yes, we did our That doesn't here. include people like me who can't enroll, right? Uh, that is, those are opt-outs, I think, or permanently rejects. I'm not exactly sure. Um, and then I just want to let people know that Cornbread uh, announced that they are expanding. They are building a second uh, store, in a second restaurant in Newark. And they are actually building three restaurants 
in um, Pennsylvania, uh, in the Pittsburgh area, as part of Walmart. So it's unbelievable. But uh, she had Adina, uh, very, uh, you know, do you remember the meeting where she came in and said, all I want to do is build this unit? And we said, no, no, you don't leave it that early. And, uh, and, and she got approval for that unit. And the last thing I have is, um, and I think you'll all agree that uh, I generally don't comment or follow the president's tweets, but his tweet over the weekend um, about telling four duly elected members of Congress, women of color, that they should go back to wherever they're from is just racist. And um, I think it's very important for us to speak out um, so I just want, I think we all in agreement that we're speaking out against the president and his actions and his tweet. Add that it's sexist as well. Um, it's, it's, it's all of that. It's, it's sexist. It. Yeah. It's bigoted. It's racist. It's just, it, it, I mean, these are individuals who, well, we know, you know, as you get into the stories about each individual, but these are duly elected members of an equal branch of government. Mm -hmm. It's just, um, we cannot allow a president or any leader of our country to do this. It's just American just citizens too. Yeah, yeah. just horrible, yeah. horrible that, you know, to divide the country the way he's doing it. So he doesn't care about yeah. any of that. So, That's the problem. Right. So anyway, I think, uh, I just want to be on record. I'm sure all of you joined me in oh, being yeah, on totally. record. That absolutely. This is, uh, hey, just, absolutely. And, and yeah. for the record, all five of us unanimously voted on a resolution last year calling for him to resign. And yes. I, I stand behind that as well. Yes. yes. Okay. Anything else? Motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 We'll see you August 6th.